Welcome to the 111th meeting of the National Advisory Council for Nursing Research. We're glad to have you with us. A special welcome to our council members and to the NINR science community. This meeting is being videocast live and will be archived on the NIH videocast website. So thank you all for joining us today. So we have a new ex officio member representing the Department of Defense, Lieutenant Colonel Covey Gardner. In addition to his duties in the United States Air Force, he is Senior Science Advisor to the Dean and Assistant Professor in the Daniel K. Inouye Graduate School of Nursing at the Uniformed Services University of the Health Sciences. Lieutenant Gardner, uh, I'm sorry, Lieutenant Colonel Gardner also serves as consultant to the Surgeon General of the Air Force and is the career field manager for nursing research. He received a direct commission into the Air Force Medical Service as a family nurse practitioner in August 2008 after a Cold War era enlistment as a medical services specialist followed by a civilian career in Texas local public health. After returning to active duty, he supported contingency operations in Afghanistan. Welcome to the council, Lieutenant Colonel Gardner. So now I will turn the meeting over to Dr. Elizabeth Charlov, NINR uh, Advisory Council's Executive Secretary, who will proceed with meeting logistics. Dr. Charlov. Thank you, Dr. Zank. Good morning and welcome. I will now do a roll call of council members to ensure we have a quorum for today's meeting. Dr. Lee has joined us remotely today. Dr. Lee, please turn on your camera and say present or here. Present. Thank you. Council members in the room, please raise your hand and say present or here when I call your name. Okay. So, Dr. Monroe. Present. Dr. Stone. Present. Dr. Fitzpatrick. Present. Dr. Ayala. Present. Do uh, Professor Dawes. Present. And Dr. Atkins. And as ex officio, Dr. Sullivan. Present. And Lieutenant Colonel Gardner. Present. Thank you. Dr. Zink, we have a quorum for this meeting. Doctors Provencio Vasquez and uh, Dr. Mallory Johnson were unable to be with us today. Now on to some logistics. Dates for future council, future council meetings are listed on the NINR Council webpage, as well as in the open session materials in the electronic council book. Please add these dates to your calendar. Our next meeting is scheduled for January 25, 2024. This will be a virtual meeting. I want to remind council members, other than ex officio, that you are special government employees. And this is where, as such, I beg your pardon. As such, you may not engage in lobbying activities while receiving pay from the federal government. Further information regarding conflict of interest and confidentiality requirements are posted in the electronic council book, so please review those if you haven't done so already. I will give more specific instructions about conflict of interest and confidentiality at the beginning of the closed session later this afternoon. Now I'll turn it back to Dr. Zank for the NINR director's report. So thank you, Elizabeth. Um, so I am pleased to share what's been going on at NINR uh, since our last council meeting. 
We'll start with an update on our strategic imperative. So as you remember in January, we announced firearm injury prevention as our first strategic imperative under the 2022-2026 NINR strategic plan. For NINR, a strategic imperative is an ongoing investment in a specific area of research that is aligned with NINR's mission. It can be viewed through most, if not all, of the lenses in our strategic plan and has the potential to make a difference in addressing our nation's most pressing health challenges. We chose firearm injury prevention as our first strategic imperative because research on this topic is aligned with NINR's updated mission to lead nursing research to solve pressing health challenges and inform practice and policy, optimizing health and advancing health equity into the future. And because we believe nursing research offers an important perspective, given that work to prevent firearm injuries and their related health sequelae may be, must be situated within the settings that nurses practice, including homes, schools, workplaces, clinics, justice settings, and the community. This is certainly one of our nation's most pressing health challenges. Consider that firearm deaths rose by 35% during 2020, reaching the highest level ever recorded in the United States. Firearm injury and death are also concerning from a health equity perspective. In 2020, counties with the highest poverty level had firearm homicide rates 4.5 times as high as counties with the lowest poverty level. And more than half of all Black teens who died in 2020 were killed by firearms. The urgency of this problem is only increasing. For example, data published just this year show social vulnerability is strongly associated with pediatric shooting incidents, as you can see in this heat map that displays the CDC's social vulnerability index in the top row and pediatric shooting incidents in the bottom row. And yet pediatric primary care screening for firearm access or prevention counseling still rarely occurs in even the most at-risk areas. So at NINR, we are taking important steps forward in addressing firearm injury prevention. So to learn more about this area of research, NINR hosted a workshop in November of 2022. After two days of pres presentations from leading researchers in the area, we identified two critical themes. First, firearm violence prevention is a pressing public health challenge and a major health equity issue, deeply influenced by the social determinants of health with structural and historical roots. Second, the potential return on investment for research in this area by nurse scientists and for research relating to nursing practice is high. NINR staff translated these themes and content from the workshop into action during a robust full day discussion to review the findings and collapse these priorities into broader research areas with the highest scientific potential. Three key areas for immediate action emerged. First, use existing research infrastructure to expand into firearm injury prevention. Second, invest in the development of a cadre of researchers prepared to do this work. And then third, address the gap in research and community health care. Following the workshop, we first developed two concepts that we believe address some of the priorities shared with us by workshop participants and which we shared with you when we announced the strategic imperative in January. The first concept focused on building capacity for firearm injury prevention research. And the second concept aimed to reduce firearm injury uh, and related health sequelae through the development, evaluation, and translation of preventive interventions in community healthcare settings. 
Addressing this urgent public health crisis requires rigorous research in firearm injury prevention, work that must be conducted by highly trained scholars using innovative methodological approaches appropriate to the complex nature of the problem. To address the lack of researchers who are prepared to do firearm injury prevention work and to start to build capacity, we released a notice of special interest in March for administrative supplements to NINR T32 institutional training grants. Administrative supplements have a relatively short turnaround, which allows a more nimble response and gets resources into the hands of researchers building on existing infrastructure. And I'm pleased to share that we are funding a supplement at Columbia University to mentor students in firearm injury prevention and health disparities in injury. So as part of a longer term strategy to build capacity in this area of research, in August, we issued a notice of intent to publish a funding opportunity to solicit applications to establish short courses in firearm injury prevention, to prepare nurse scientists and scientists in aligned fields to conduct firearm injury prevention research. This funding opportunity should be out in the next few days, so stay tuned. And we hope that then awards will be available next summer. So frequently, the first healthcare contact for individuals seeking care, especially in community settings, um, are nurses. They are trained, as you know, to assess physical and mental health and identify risk factors for injury. And as I mentioned, there is a critical gap in research related to firearm injury prevention in community healthcare settings. So just a couple of weeks ago on September 1st, we posted a funding opportunity for firearm injury prevention research in community healthcare settings. Under this initiative, NINR is interested in creative approaches to firearm injury prevention that capitalize on community healthcare settings to identify risk factors, reduce exposures in individuals, families, and communities, and prevent injury and reoccurrence of injury, as well as, well as mitigating health disparities. This opportunity encourages approaches that maximize the contributions of nurses and integrates the principles of holistic nursing care. The first round of applications is due on November 7th, with a second round of applications due on July 26th. So let me highlight one of the studies already in NINR's research portfolio focused on firearm injury prevention. In this mixed method study, researchers are examining the multi-level risk and protective factors of firearm injury risk among Asian Americans and their relationship with neighborhood structural level racism and discrimination to determine the mechanisms between these factors and firearm outcomes. So we are especially excited to support this collaboration between investigators at Eastern Michigan University School of Nursing and the University of Michigan School of Public Health, as we think it's indicative of the multidisciplinary collaboration that we call for in our strategic plan and that we deem as necessary for addressing our most pressing health challenges. So let's move on to some additional funding updates. Since we met in May, we published a notice of special interest on nurse burnout. With this NOCI, we're encouraging the development and evaluation of novel organizational interventions that will build new knowledge on how to prevent and mitigate nurse burnout in a wide variety of settings. That includes hospitals and clinics, schools and workplaces, homes and long-term care facilities, justice and other settings. Interventions may include those addressing key factors in healthcare settings that influence burnout and well being, such as bureaucracy, organizational mission and values, culture and leadership, administrative burden, among many others. Though the primary goal of this NOCI is prevention or mitigation of nurse burnout, other outcomes include those such as nurse satisfaction, retention, engagement, and absenteeism, as well as occupational injury, turnover, and costs. 
in August, we published a notice of um, funding opportunity to solicit applications to establish short courses and nursing research on social determinants of health. This program will support the creation and implementation of short courses of up to one year to develop a cohort of nurse scientists and scientists in aligned fields equipped to understand, conduct, and evaluate research on social determinants of health in support of the strategic plan. Nursing has long appreciated that health, health must be understood within the context of people's lives and living conditions. Social determinants of health provides a lens to understand and intervene upon midstream and upstream factors that shape individual and population health with a, with a critical emphasis on health equity. By increasing nurse scientists' access to rigorous multidisciplinary education and training in SDOH research, this initiative will support the power and potential of nursing to advance health and health equity for all. In addition to these NINR-led opportunities, we've signed on to initiatives of other institute centers and offices. For example, we are supporting the Native American Research Centers for Health, or NARCH. The NARCH program was launched in 2000 to help reduce the distrust in health research by the American Indian Alaska Native communities, promote health research prioritized and led by eligible American Indian and Alaska Native tribal entities, and ultimately improve American Indian and Alaska Native health. We've also signed on to a funding opportunity that supports a collaboration between NIH and the National Science Foundation. It supports innovative, high-risk, high-reward research with a promise of disruptive transformations in biomedical and public health research. So let me now turn to some news on our partnerships and collaborations. As you all know, we cannot solve our nation's most intractable health challenges and the most persistent health disparities without making social determinants of health a priority. So in 2022, NINR helped launch the NIH-wide Social Determinants of Health Research Coordinating Committee, which was created out of an urgent need to develop a coordinated strategy to propel discoveries to improve individual and population health reduce health disparities, and advance health equity. Growing out of a grassroots effort by staff across the NIH, the SDOH RCC's overarching goal is to accelerate research across diseases and conditions, population, stages of the life course, and SDOH domains. It also focuses on effectively leveraging SDOH investments and innovations across NIH institutes, centers, and offices to advance science in this very dynamic, multidisciplinary field, ranging from foundational research to intervention research to implementation science. At last count, 20 NIH institutes, centers, and offices, including NINR, um, serve on the executive committee, and even more are represented on the RCC at large which is a clear indication of the growing recognition of the importance of this area of research. I am proud to co-chair this committee with my colleague, Dr. Eliseo Perez Estable, a director of the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities. Recently, as Dr. Perez Estable and I announced in a blog post, this committee shared a new conceptualization of social determinants of health, which we believe can be applied to any area of NIH science and well beyond. We describe SDOH as the conditions in which people are born, grow, learn, work, play, live, and age, and the wider set of structural factors shaping the conditions of daily life. And we emphasize that addressing SDOH is critical to population, community, and individual health and advancing health equity. So you can read more uh, on our blog post uh, on the NINR website. So I'd like to walk you through some of the key tenets of the conceptualization. 
Structural factors include social, economic, and legal forces, systems, and policies that determine opportunities and access to high quality jobs, education, housing, transportation, the built environment, information and communication infrastructure, food and healthcare, the social environment, as well as other conditions of daily life. Further, SDOH can improve, maintain, or hinder health through multiple direct, indirect, and interacting mechanistic pathways. SDOH may interact with other determinants of health, such as biological, psychological, behavioral, and environmental factors to further promote or compromise health. And we know that SDOH influence family and individual level social and economic circumstances, such as income, educational attainment, access to digital tools and broadband, nutrition security, and housing stability. We also know that SDOH may have different health consequences within and across populations due to differences in exposure as well as susceptibility to health promoting and health compromising conditions of daily life. And importantly, our conceptualization recognizes that structural factors rooted in racism, sexism, homophobia, classism, and other discriminatory systems shape the extent to which the conditions of daily life are equitably distributed in society or whether they are unfairly distributed based on race, ethnicity, sex, gender identity, sexual orientation, socioeconomic position, or geography and their intersections. Exposures created by intersecting socio-demographic and identity factors highlight the importance of an intersectional lens and approaches to SDOH research. As you know, uh, shifting gears, NINR co-leads the IMPROVE initiative with NICHD and with the NIH office of research on women's health. And we have got great news to share. NIH has awarded $24 million in first year funding to establish maternal health research centers of excellence. The centers will work towards reducing maternal morbidity and mortality across um, populations and promoting health equity. Funding for the centers were awarded after a competitive peer review process. These centers of excellence include 10 research centers across the nation, a data innovation and coordinating hub, and an implementation science hub. So as an example of how structural and social factors are integrated into the funding centers of excellence, a central focus of the funded center of excellence in Wisconsin is housing instability and its effects on maternal physical and mental health and pregnancy outcomes. So Dr. D Diana Bianchi will have more information to share uh, from the IMPROVE initiative later in our meeting. Uh, but I did want to mention this good news about the Centers of Excellence. The Compass Health Equity Research Hubs announced a funding announcement in late August. The hubs will serve as centralized research resources providing tailored scientific, technical, and collaborative support for community engagement, research capacity building, and training to support community-led health equity structural intervention projects in collaboration with the Compass Coordination Center. NIH staff conducted a technical assistance webinar on September 6th to provide information as well as to answer questions from potential applicants. Applications are due by the end of October. Awards have not yet been announced uh, for the community-led health equity structural intervention sites or the coordination center, um, but Dr. Cheryl Boyce will be joining us uh, to answer your questions and share a bit more, and more will be coming out very soon about uh, our first awards. I wanna now turn to the Climate Change and Health Initiative. Um, as you know, we are on the executive committee for this initiative, and we're supporting two current funding opportunities. One encourages applications that address the impact of climate change on health and well-being. The other solicits P20 planning applications for climate change and health research centers. These centers will support transdisciplinary research on the impacts of climate change on health. 
We're also funding several studies under this initiative on topics ranging from environmental exposures and health uh, to heat and kidney disease. As you know, we hosted a climate change and health scholar, Dr. Patrice Nicholas, from February till July. Dr. Nicholas spoke at three brown bag seminars to staff, which averaged nearly 60 staff uh, each. We also led an NIH-wide seminar in April. So we certainly want to thank Dr. Nicholas for sharing her expertise with all of us at NINR and NIH. As I proposed at our meeting in May, we have also formed a working group under the auspices of Council to further explore this topic. So led by NINR's Dr. John Grayson and Council's Dr. Betty Beckemeyer, this work group will be charged with considering the current state of the science, assessing pressing health research questions, and ultimately recommending to Council areas of research where nursing science can potentially have the biggest impact in addressing the health effects of climate change. The current work group roster is shown here, and we are grateful to all of these individuals for their willingness to contribute their time and their energy to this important topic. The group will meet for the first time at the end of September, so in just a, a week or two, and several more times over the next few months, uh, with the goal of presenting recommendations to the Council at the January 24 meeting. Along with the working group, we're also seeking comments and testimonies from the extramural scientific community, professional societies, and the general public regarding the health impacts of climate-associated events to assist with identifying research gaps in which nursing research can make a difference and or provide a unique perspective. The RFI will be posted soon and will be available for public comment. The working group's recommendations together with what we learn from this RFI will inform potential future NINR research initiatives and other efforts in climate change and health that we hope to start in 2024. So the Helping to End Addiction Long-Term or HEAL initiative in which NINR is participating wants to confront opioid addiction in Native communities, which have been disproportionately affected by the crisis. So over the next seven years, the Native Collective Research Effort to Enhance Wellness, or NCREW program, will build partnerships with tribes and supporting organizations to conduct research. Currently, there are two funding opportunities under NCREW. One is addressing overdose, substance use, mental health, and pain. The other is for the Native Research Resource Network. So in other related funding news, the HEAL initiative um, on prevention and management of chronic pain in rural populations, uh, which was the concept um, that Council approved last year, has funded three applications, two of which are being administered by NINR. NINR is also participating in the HEAL Initiative partnerships to advance interdisciplinary uh, training and clinical pain research. This initiative is to bolster the dwindling clinical pain research workforce by supporting interdisciplinary postdoctoral training to promote the next generation of independent clinical pain researchers. And I want to acknowledge that Though the Palliative Care Research Cooperative Group ended in June, capacity and resources live on in this initiative. So please check out the website for the group's mission, history, and successes. Founded in 2010, NINR was one of six organizations that funded this cooperative group. We are proud to have been on the PCRC Executive Committee and to have been part of its accomplishments like research support, mentorship, and the creation of nine special interest groups. So thank you to everyone uh, who participated in the PCRC throughout the years. I also have uh, NINR specific news and announcements to share with you. NINR researchers have published a number of studies since our last meeting, um, but here are some findings of notes. An NINR supported study found racial disparities in the use of cesareans in healthy first time mothers, with black and Hispanic individuals having nearly double the odds compared to white mothers of ending labor with an unplanned cesarean. 
In a second finding, NINR-supported researchers found that unmet basic needs, as predicted by food insecurity and history of homelessness and past incarceration, resulted in significantly lower odds of HIV antiretroviral therapy medication adherence among Black people living with HIV providing evidence linking social determinants of health and social disenfranchisement to medication adherence. And lastly, NINR-supported scientists developed a natural language processing system to detect eviction status from 5,000 electronic health record notes from the Veterans Health Administration. This system su substantially improved classification, and the researchers are going to deploy it as an eviction surveillance system for the VHA. We have exciting news about the 2023 Debut Challenge Prize. Each year, the National Institute of Biomedical Imaging and Bioengineering and VentureWell conduct a challenge for undergraduate student teams to develop technol technology solutions for unmet needs in healthcare. Five NIH partners participated um, in providing a prize each to the team with the most innovative technology in their respective fields. This includes the NIH Office of AIDS Research, NIMHD, NCI, NICHD, and NINR. So NINR awarded the 2023 Debut Challenge Prize in the Technologies to Empower Nurses in Community Settings category to a four-woman team from Clemson University called RAM Inc. for their USERT design. USERT is a diaper urinalysis-like insert containing reagents to indicate the presence of a urinary tract infection in pediatric populations. It's a cost-effective diagnostic test that can be used in clinic or at home. It can save nurses time and increase UTI testing in low resource settings. So we wanna congratulate these very innovative undergraduates. In June, Dr. Tai Chi Goto, a research fellow in Dr. Leo Saligan's intramural research group, presented at the 2023 NIH Pain Consortium Symposium on Advances in Pain Research. In fact, members of the NIH Pain Consortium a Symposium elevated his abstract from a poster to an oral presentation based on its significance, innovation, and quality. Dr. Goto's study is exciting in that it provides new insight into the association between a specific polymorphism and neuropathic pain among cancer survivors. Not only could this insight be used to alleviate pain, but it can also be used to prevent pain in this group. So we are proud um, of Dr. Goto for his work and representation of nursing science at this NIH consortium. Last month, summer fellows in the intramural program presented their posters at the NIH Poster Day sessions. It was hybrid once again. NIRNR's fellows included four in their bachelor's program and two working on their doctoral degrees. Some of the topics the interns presented included a virtual reality grocery store, quantitative analyses of RYR1, pain prediction, monitoring disparities of patients with COPD, and the role of sleep diaries. So congratulations to everyone for their great work. Proud to have them at NINR over the summer. So I'd like to share some recent NINR events. In July, we held our final director's lecture in our series on NINR strategic lenses. Dr. Sarah Stoddard of the University of Michigan and Dr. Paul Keenert of the Public Health Accreditation Board addressed our population and community health lens. We had over 300 participants in the webinar, so I want to thank them for their insights that they shared in this well-received lecture. And in June, we co-hosted a lecture with our colleagues at the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities and the NIH Office of Behavioral and Social Sciences Research. So our very own council member, Professor Daniel Dawes, shared his expertise on health equity, health reform, health systems transformation, and social and political determinants of health. 
Afterwards, he joined me for a Q&A. So I am so pleased to report we had over 600 participants for Professor Dawes' lecture. We wanna thank you once again for sharing your insights with us. Recordings of both of these lectures are available on our website. So I encourage you to check them out if you didn't have a chance to join live. I am happy to announce uh, that following a national search, we have selected Dr. Courtney Acklin as Deputy Director of NINR. Dr. Acklin has over 15 years of research administration and leadership experience at NIH. She has been Acting Associate Deputy Director NIH for the past two years. She has also worked as Chief of Staff at NIMHD and has worked for NIMH and NINDS. Dr. Acklin has led several NIH-wide high-impact activities, including the IMPROVE Initiative, the Mental Health and Wellbeing Action Team, and the Resilience Through Wellbeing Campaign. She also co-led NIH's COVID Intra-Action Review and the Intramural Research Program Budget and Reporting Initiative. She has a background and interest in community-based work and behavioral and social sciences relating to health disparities and pediatric mental health. She is a licensed clinical psychologist with a PhD in clinical psychology from the University of Maryland College Park and a BA in Business Administration and Psychology from the University of Richmond. So her wealth of knowledge and experience at NIH will be an asset to us here at NINR. She will be starting very soon, but not soon enough, on uh, <laughs> October 2nd. So I'm really looking forward to all of you having a chance to meet her at our next council meeting. I am pleased to welcome new staff and fellows to NINR. Josh Bull came on board in June as a scientific review officer. Susan Toy also joined the division working as a grants management specialist. Julia Say, Sylvia Long, and Karen McNamara are working as program officers. We gained a deputy CIO in our IT department, Don Seymour, and a help desk support with Nova Kong. Two technical writers joined the Division of Science Policy and Public Liaison in July to work on six-month contracts. The rest of the staff and fellows work in the intramural research program. So we are very happy to have brought on three more fellows. Lastly, there's Lauren Hashiguchi, who is another type of fellow, a presidential management fellow. She started with us just last month. So we want to welcome all of these uh, staff and fellows to NINR. We are saying goodbye to two NINR staff members. Dr. Louise Rosenbaum has been our science policy analyst and writer for 11 years. She works in our division of science policy and public liaison. She is set to retire on September 29th. Dr. Sabrina Wong has been our scientific director in our division of intramural research. Research. She is resigning at the end of the month. So we want to thank both of them for their service and we wish them all the best on their respective journeys. We also are saying goodbye to Dr. Patty Brennan, who was not only the director of the National Library of Medicine, but was also the director of the Advanced Visualization Lab here at NINR. She will be retiring at the end of the month. She led NLM for seven years, being the first nurse, industrial engineer, and female to lead the library. Her unique career path helped guide her approach in integrating artificial intelligence and machine learning to make advances. She modernized, strengthened, and expanded information systems like PubMed and clinicaltrials.gov. She also advocated for and spearheaded NLM's efforts to undertake a major building transformation, maybe just a restoration, not a transformation, restoration only. Transformation, okay, anyway. So um, here at NINR, Patty developed uh, interactive virtual reality simulations to enable patients with a variety of health conditions to rehearse problem-solving behaviors to improve their health outcomes. So Dr. Stephen Sherry, who currently serves as director of NLM's National Center for Biotechnology Information and NLM Associate Director for Scientific Data Resources has agreed to serve as the acting NLM director. And we have some news to share about NIH. 
The NIH director's Wednesday afternoon lecture series, known as WALS, is the highest profile lecture program at the NIH. Each season, some of the biggest names in health research are selected as speakers. So we are excited to announce that an NINR-supported NINR investigator, Dr. Deborah Moser from the University of Kentucky, has been selected as a WALS lecturer for April 2024. Dr. Moser was nominated by NINR and the Rural Health Special Interest Group, which is co-chaired by Dr. Karen Kale of NINR and Dr. Don Morales of NIMH. So we'll have more details as we get closer to that event. This year, NIH announced that it would be accepting submissions for a new initiative that rewards academic institutions for enhancing DEIA. NIH is seeking programs that enhance our understanding of effective strategies and practices to create cultures of inclusive excellence and enhance diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. NIH expects the prize competition will identify many different approaches that may be scalable to other institutions across the health research enterprise. NIH will award up to 10 prizes of $100,000 each. That's a $1 million in total if you're doing the math through the competition. To participate, registration is required by today at 5 o'clock. So, um, you know, if you're busy on your computer, I'll know why. Uh, so that's 5 o'clock Eastern time. Entries are being accepted through Tuesday, September 26. For eligibility and guidelines, you can visit the website. We have exciting news about a new initiative. The NIH Build Up Trust Challenge seeks to increase research participation by building trust and improving engagement with historically underrepresented communities. The Build Up Trust Challenge will award as many as 10 finalists up to $45,000 each. Okay, that might be too much math, although it's pretty easy, isn't it? Um, and the opportunity to win up one of four 200,000 prize. $200,000 prizes for promising strategies that increase research participation and improve trust in medical care in historically underserved communities. So you have more time on this one. You can register by Tuesday, November 14th. NIH currently has an RFI seeking input on its mission statement presented here. So let me give you a little bit of background. Two years ago, NIH established an advisory committee to the director, working group on diversity, and the subgroup on disability had this to say about the mission statement. One immediate action for the NIH to support disability inclusion is to remove the language of reducing disability from the NIH mission statement. The current mission statement could be interpreted as perpetuating ableist beliefs, that disabled people are flawed and need to be fixed. The proposed mission statement is to seek fundamental knowledge about the nature and behavior of living systems and to apply that knowledge to optimize health and prevent or reduce illness for all people. The RFI is open to staff employed at NIH, institutions receiving support, and the public. Responses are due by midnight on Friday, November 24th. So please do consider giving feedback on the mission statement. We want to welcome Dr. Jane Simone, who joined us in July as the NIH Associate Director for Behavioral and Social Sciences Research and Director of the NIH Office of Behavioral and Social Sciences Research, or OBSSR. Dr. Simone is a clinical psychologist with more than 25 years of experience in research, focused on health disparities and resilience among populations that have been socially marginalized, including persons with HIV and other chronic illnesses, Latinx, LGBT, and indigenous peoples. Dr. Karina Walters of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma has been named director of the Tribal Health Research Office. She's a social epidemiologist and health prevention scholar, formerly a tenured professor and the Catherine Hall Chamber Scholar at the University of Washington School of Social Work. She also served as an adjunct professor in the Department of Global Health and the School of Public Health. She is the founding director of the EUW Indigenous Wellness Research Institute. So welcome to Dr. Walters. 
there's so many new people. It's exciting. Um, so Dr. Uh, Gini Mazzoni has been, uh, Gini, Gini, wow. Okay, Gini Mazzoni. Uh, <laughs> I just, oh, I feel so bad. I should start over. Okay. Uh, Dr. Jeannie Marosa has been selected as the next director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. As the NIAID uh, director, Dr. M uh, Maza wrote, I better pronounce her name before she comes, um, will oversee NIAID's budget of $6.3 billion, which supports research to advance the understanding, diagnosis, and treatment of infectious, immunologic, and allergic diseases. She's an infectious disease specialist joining NIH from the University of Alabama at Birmingham, where she served as director of the Division of Infectious Diseases since 2016. She is internationally recognized for her research and education efforts in the field of sexually transmitted infections, and especially as they affect women's health. So let's have a quick budget update as we're drawing to a close. Here's our appropriations history over the last few years. The president submitted his fiscal year 24 budget to Congress back in March, highlighting his priorities for NIH. The president's proposed budget retains the $10 million enacted for health disparities research that NINR received in fiscal year 23. Now, Congress will ultimately decide the final funding levels based on the House subcommittee draft and the Senate LHHS bill. It's looking like NINR funding for fiscal year 24 will be flat and retain the $10 million from fiscal year 23. Now, most institute centers and offices are preparing for a flat or even decreasing budgets in fiscal year 24, but we will have uh, a better idea in the near future. So that brings me to a conversation I'd like to have as I wrap up. Um, so, and that's about the fiscal year 24 budget and beyond. As I mentioned, both the president and Congress have proposed flat budgets for NINR and for most of NIH as well in fiscal year 24. With the caveat, of course, that you know we don't know how fiscal year 24 will ultimately play out in the weeks and potentially months to come. For several years now, NIH has been fortunate to receive budget increases from Congress, and we have been very grateful for that support. But as we look ahead to next year and the years to come, we have to recognize that challenges may be on the horizon and we have to plan accordingly. So, and you know, that's really for any scenario, uh, any budget increases, budget cuts, and even flat budgets, which are in effect just smaller budget cuts uh, because of the way cost of doing science continues to uh, increase. Now, NIH has, of course, dealt with similar challenges in the past, but it has been some time. So I thought it was worth a discussion with all of you today to hear your thoughts on planning for the years to come and what strategies we should consider for our extramural programs. So when it comes to training and science initiatives as we make funding decisions, you know, there are a number of questions we could consider. Should we fund fewer awards? Should we prioritize new and early stage investigators? Should we just cut all awards by a certain percentage and just call it a day? Or should we use a more precise approach? Should we fund more short-term projects to reduce our out-year commitments? Um, remember, you know, deciding now on a new R01 commits us to fund that project for, you know, at least three and often five years. You know, how should we think about training and our priorities there? So we'd love to hear your thoughts on these topics and things that we should consider as we think about our strategies uh, in the coming year and years ahead. Any thoughts? Interesting. Um, I do think the training and the early stage investigators is very important. We know we don't have enough nurse scientists um, and we need more nurse scientists. So I think supporting that is really important for the, the future generation of nurse scientists. Mm -hmm. The other part is how to, how to create, and I don't know how to do this, but there are 
research intensive universities. I come from one, you know, um, and how do we support the nurse scientists that the people that are getting their PhDs in the non research intensive environments, but making the it rigorous, I don't know, like partnerships between not, I don't know, non rigorous. What's the wrong word non rigorous the 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 settings that want to support right people that aren't at the the institutions that have the most infrastructure and how do we do that thinking about that and finding you know innovative ways I think could help support the um, next generation of their scientists well, thank you for the sharing that and I would agree that it's a little bit of a conundrum because we definitely need to support the pipeline but if there's no senior investigators to support the development of those people they're going to struggle um, so I, I like the idea of thinking of ways to partner institutions um, so that we're able to most effectively make the use of the investments that NINR makes. I just love to second Dr. Stone and Dr. Monroe's comments. Um, you know, as I thought about your presentation today, I love the fact that you've adopted this very comprehensive and articulated approach to addressing health inequities. And I love the idea of you all being bold in your approach and addressing those underrated issues in research, um, in particular climate change, social determinants of health, exposing folks. So I do think if, if uh, push comes to shove, I wouldn't wanna see those two critical areas that you mentioned as um, you know, on the chopping block. I do think they're very critical. Perhaps your point about maybe, um, what was it that you mentioned? You talked about uh, maybe funding fewer awards uh, to ensure that we don't lose the gains that we may make in these other areas that are critical to health equity. Thank you for that. Um, I had a question regarding the new mechanisms table because I was wondering, and it was on the meeting materials, I wonder, I didn't recall seeing smaller type interventions. And so I think that's one of the beautiful things that you have going on is you have that focus on change and spe specifically system change, community change, uh, but they're big, they're all big grants. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering if that might be possible because then it also might align with if you retain more of a focus on the early stage, kind of that developmental period for them to get up to a larger grant. Although I do agree with Dr. Monroe that we need the senior people as well. So yeah, tough call. Yeah, tough, yeah, yeah. Oh, thanks, Shannon. Good Hi. morning. Good morning. Um, yeah, Dr. Stone and Monroe, um, I think that idea of, of finding ways to create these partnerships um, given that uh, we know to, to change the narrative, we really have to change the narrators. And I think um, even at, at, the, at the most elite and resource in, um, intensive places, we don't necessarily have um, the broadest and widest diversity of, of different voices at the table. And I think creating those bridges between um, minority, minority serving institutions and HBCUs um, and places just in um, a lot of our our communities of greatest disinvestment. Um, you know, we've talked about um, the Mississippi Delta and the Rust Belt and Appalachia and tribal lands, finding ways to connect those. So when you look at where the um, distribution of, of the most resource um, intense places are, they're not in those places. And, uh, and to probably create these bridges, I think, um, is something that to me, it seems like a really good strategy and a, and a good way for us to um, be strategic and smart. In thinking about this, of all the two minutes I've been thinking about it, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, one of the ways, like the uh, the no C for firearm supplements was really good, um, but I could see a no C for T32s to get somebody that's 
you know, from a minority or HCVU, you know, to bring them in, not to your program, they go through another program, but to get mentorship through a T32 and another program. Mm -hmm. um, and that, you you know, to that that's a, seems like something that could be done that would reach out to other people to get them the experience. That Granted, mm -hmm. I thought about it all for three minutes. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for these ideas. Anything else you want to share? This isn't your last chance. You can always reach out to us at any time to let us know your thoughts, and we'll keep you posted, of course. Thank you for this. This was helpful. Thank you. All right, so um, I do want to acknowledge my colleagues at NINR, Joni Dawson and Adrian Burroughs, for all their help in compiling all that massive information for the update. I also want to thank um, all my colleagues here at NINR and on council for all your support um, of the Institute. So you can always reach out to us at any time, including at the email address you see here, um, and we'll get uh, your email to the right person. So with that, um, I see my colleague uh, coming to the stage, so to speak, uh, Dr. Joni Rudder. Dr. Rudder is the director of the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, also known as NCATS. Dr. Rudder oversees the planning and execution of the center's complex multifaceted programs that aim to overcome scientific and operational barriers impeding the development and delivery of new treatments and other health solutions. Under her direction, NCAT supports innovative tools and strategies to make each step of the translational process more effective and efficient, speeding research across a range of diseases with a particular focus on rare diseases. By advancing the science of translation, NCATS helps to turn promising research discoveries into real-world applications that improve people's health. In her previous role as the NCATS Deputy Director, she collaborated with colleagues from across government, academia, industry, and nonprofit patient organizations to establish robust interactions with NCATS programs. Now, prior to joining NCAS, Dr. Rudder served as the Director of Scientific Programs for the All of Us Research Program, where she led scientific programmatic development and implementation efforts to build a national cohort of at least 1 million U.S. participants to advance precision medicine. During her time at NIH, she has also led the Division of Neuroscience and Behavior at the National Institute on Drug Abuse. In this role, she developed and coordinated research on basic and clinical neuroscience, brain and behavioral development, genetics, epigenetics, computational neuroscience, bioinformatics, and drug discovery. She also coordinated NIDA's Genetics Consortium and Biospecimen Repository. So today, she will share NCAT's priorities and potential opportunities for collaboration with NINR. Welcome, Dr. Rudder. That was a very generous introduction. I really appreciate that introduction. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me here today. And I'd especially like to thank uh, Dr. Zenk for the for the invitation and NINR. And I didn't realize that you were so tall. I'm pulling this micro this microphone down. Um, just a little. Yeah, you're giant. Uh, I had no idea. Um, I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about um, what what we're doing at NCATS and and how it intersects. I think quite well with with what you're doing in the, the, the nursing institute. And, um, but to do that, I want to tell you a little bit about who we are and what we do and, and some of our, our goals and aspirations, I suppose, over the next 10 years. And then talks about some of the highlights that, that we have related to nursing research and some potential opportunities, I think, down the road. So I'm just going to jump right in. But before I go, I wanted to let you know that I use QR codes quite a bit, uh, throughout the presentation, mainly because if you're interested in following up on any, any resource that I have up there, you just take a photo and then you'll, you'll, you'll have it, um, for you to peruse at, at some point later on. Um, but I wanted to make sure that you have access to a lot of the information that I'll be relaying today. Um, so, uh, a little bit about, uh, NCATS is, is that, um, the challenge that we think about quite a bit is the, it, it, it's a public health challenge in that we have over 10,000 diseases 
that are out there. And only 5% of those diseases have a treatment or a cure. And with that, the time it takes to develop treatments or, or, or therapies to get into clinical trials is about 10 to 15 years. Then even getting into medicine cabinets is even more than that, another 10 to 15 years. So it can take a long time. And it, at a budget of about $2.6 billion, uh, that's a lot of time, a lot of money. Not only that, probably one of the more dire statistics here is that nine out of 10 times a promising therapeutic candidate that enters clinical trials fails. 60% of the time, about 60% of the time, it fails in phase two. Um, so that's the, the efficacy phase. And then the other 25, 30% of the time, it fails in phase one. So uh, the safety phase. So that safety efficacy, we're just not doing a very good job preclinically to really understand how we can be more predictive about what can be very valuable for reaching the uh, the people who really need these types of, of therapies. So this is a big problem for us that we think we can we can start to tackle in a very systematic way. And so this is really the whole point of what ANCATS is about. Our mission is to turn research observations into health solutions through translational science. And, and what we like to talk about here is the idea that along the translational science pipeline, there are these barriers, these bottlenecks that prevent us from moving very quickly down the road. And so if we can tackle those bottlenecks or barriers, we would be able to then move more things through that pipeline. So this is a, you know, very, uh, a, a graphic, uh, uh, illustration of this that, that it's a little hyperbolic, but you get the idea that this is what we need to do is start to address these bottlenecks. And so through translational science, we want to use translational research and the projects for any very specific research program that we're doing to be the example of what can we do better? What can we do faster? What can we do more effectively and efficiently? And this helps us address then those longstanding bottlenecks in that pipeline so that new treatments can reach people faster. And if we can do that in any given project, then on the next project, we can start to apply those learnings and hopefully start to chip away at that time frame. And so, so there, are, I wanted to provide you some examples of what these bottlenecks are because I can, I can say bottlenecks all I want, but, but you want to know what those are. They're operational bottlenecks. Um, we use a one size fits all approach to, to clinical trials. We're starting to get out of that mold. We, uh, we have low enrollment and low diversity in clinical trials. This is a long standing problem. And I think collectively in a lot of the work that, that Dr. Zink is doing through common fund programs and other areas, um, across the NIH, um, we're starting to get at how we can really en enhance community engagement to tackle these sorts of issues. But those are, uh, those are just some of these problems, but there are administrative problems, workforce development problems, and, and even scientific problems. But a lot of times, it's not the scientific problems that are the hardest. Sometimes it's really those administrative and operational ones that are pretty challenging. So we take the holistic view of the remit of really tackling those problems to understand how it can make things go more efficiently. So these are some of the solutions uh, that we have. Uh, we're working on at NCATS here shown in purple, and I want to highlight some of these as I go through the presentation today. But all in all, this is how we think that we can um, really address bringing more treatments for all people more quickly. And we've actually turned that into our, our sort of three audacious goals of more treatments, all people more quickly. And so for more treatments, I mentioned we have 5% of those treatments with a well, diseases with a, with a treatment. What if we can bring that up to 25%, a five-fold increase of, of diseases with treatments? That's, that's something that, that's audacious. Um, we've been at 5% for a very long time, but we have new tools, new technologies. We have the, the skill and ability to be able to bring more treatments for all people more quickly. And so I believe that we have the ability to do this. And I would rather fail at 25% then succeed at 6%. And so this is why we really need to have that audaciousness there. And so for all people, this is, this is exactly what it sort of encompasses, dramatically increasing inclusivity across every area we support, from training and workforce development to mid-career development through PIs, 
uh, leading different studies through uh, increasing diversity in, 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 in all of the work that we do, not just clinically, but also preclinically. And, and so the, this is what I mean by, by for all people. We, we really need to make a, a difference here. And then lastly, more quickly, we want to enable diagnostics um, uh, and, and therapeutics to reach people twice as fast. Uh, and just an example here, a tidbit of information is that uh, much of the work that we do at NCATS really focuses on rare diseases. There are over 10,000 rare diseases, let alone all of the diseases. And so this is a big area for us to really uh, use as, as a, a, a sort of um, North Star of how we will how we look at translational science and with those rare diseases it takes about seven to ten years on average for a person with a rare disease to be diagnosed so if we cut that time in half that would add a huge amount of value for those rare disease populations right now most of the time given the time it takes to diagnose somebody with a rare disease they have already aged out a particular window of where they might have modifying therapies. So this is a critical problem for us to really start to address. So these are some of the ideas that we want to tackle along the way at NCATS. And, and some of the key approaches that we use are shown here. We want to understand what's similar across diseases to spur multiple treatments at a time. This is critical. With over 10,000 diseases, if we go one disease at a time, we will be here for a long time, and we aren't here for a long time. So we need to figure out something else that will make this go a little bit faster and better. We want to develop models that better predict a person's reaction to a therapy. So uh, this is a lot of the effort that we're doing in the preclinical space. Uh, we know that rodents aren't really humans, um, and this is part of the issue that we need to address. At the same time, that's the gold standard right now. So, uh, so we need to figure out how to build models that can better recapitulate the human condition. We need to enhance clinical trials and clinical studies so that the the results and the people who are in them more accurately reflect the patient population of what we're trying to study. And, and this is, this sounds easy, but it's not. And we need to do a lot better in terms of our effort to get there. And then lastly, we want to leverage real world data and real world evidence to uh, address these public health needs. And that's a, a big impetus as well uh, through what we're doing in this space. And uh, I'll, I'll just also show the, the NCATS budget at a glance slide here. Um, this is the, the pie, so to speak, of, of NCATS. And uh, you see that about 68 to 70% of that budget is, uh, is dedicated, and it's a line item, it's dedicated to our Clinical and Translational Science Awards program. This is a flagship program at the NIH um, it's a, a, and at NCATS. Um, it's the largest program um, at, at NIH, and and so we're we're uh, thrilled to be able to steward the work that gets conducted under this particular program. But this is about 63 uh, different institutions that are important in addressing the clinical and translational science across the country and building that infrastructure needed to do the work that we need to do. And then across all of the other areas that we supported in CATS, that's the uh, the remaining part of that. That, that budget there that's shown in the, in the purple part of the pie. Um, and, and that is about drug development, drug repurposing, high throughput screening for our intramural program primarily, um, early translation and late translation through pre-IND phases, uh, therapeutic development, um, tissues on chips, 3D bioprinting, uh, diagnostics. Uh, th these are all the areas that we support uh, through the other uh, part of this budget, um, including the training uh, and education programs that we support as well. And uh, so, so I wanted to just give you a sense that we're, we're a $923 million um, um, center. And, and uh, again, the bulk of that is really around building the infrastructure to support a lot of these activities. And so now I just want to give you a sense of some of those preclinical, clinical, and, and other data science approaches that we're doing that I think intersect quite well with what the Nursing Institute, um, in, uh, inst uh, nursing institute research interests are as well. And I'm going to start on the preclinical side. I mentioned this idea of that 90% failure rate and, and that, that mice aren't people, rodents aren't people. Two-dimensional cell lines also aren't really reflective of, of the physiological condition. Um, so so they're, we're not doing a great job doing this. And so what NCATS is, is working on um, in, a, in a very large way is to understand how can we better physiologically recapitulate the human condition on a chip or, or in a 3D printed way. And so we're increasing the complexity of the kinds of 
of, of cells that we can pull together that actually are, are multiple cell types that create spheroids and organoids, and we can actually print these in a way that represents the tissue or the organ system and look at that more collectively and holistically in a research environment. And the, the issue here, though, is that you increase complexity of the kinds of research that you're doing on a chip. Um, you actually decrease your ability to do high throughput screening. And so we're trying to make sure that we're addressing that balance to, to not lose so much on that high throughput screening capability while also maximizing our ability to recapitulate as much as we can in that physiologically relevant condition. So here's a way that we're developing new technologies that can better predict um, a, a person's response to a particular threat treatment or how to understand perhaps diseases in different ways and, and be able to evaluate that more effectively. And one of the programs that we um, uh, uh, support is called the Tissue Chips in Space Program. We have created these, these tissue chips for just about every organ in the human body. Um, and what's interesting, though, is what we learned from our, our uh, counterparts at NASA when they send their astronauts into the space station. The astronauts can spend many months in the space station and they almost nearly immediately start to experience some disease conditions, like they have, uh, they're immunocompromised for a bit, um, they have uh, their heart function uh, starts to deteriorate, their muscle function starts to deteriorate, they experience bone loss. Now, the good news is that when they return to Earth, that actually, um, it, it goes back to normal. So it can be regenerated in a way. Um, but that microphysiological or that the, the microphysiological chips that go up into space as well can actually detect those, those differences in the cell types that we send up into space in that uh, low Earth orbit gravity. So that microgravity environment turns out to be very critical. And it tells us a lot about that aging process. And for lack of a better word, that's kind of what we're calling these issues, is this these aging issues. And so when we get these chips back from space in the capsule they're shown on the lower right, we then are able to evaluate um, different markers within the systems that we're using. And a lot of times we identify different areas of inflammation that are very critical. And we're seeing upticks um, in, in how those inflammatory responses are being, are being uh, tweaked a little bit. And that may be part of the issue and what's causing those problems. So by doing this, we're able to learn and understand a, in this environment in a more, in a faster way than we would be ever be able to do on earth what those might be and how we can use that, bring that back to Earth and identify particular areas where we could follow up for therapeutic development. So that's why this program is so import important. And that partnership um, with NASA has been critical for allowing us to be able to do this. They're interested for understanding how they can uh, examine how to put uh, perhaps people in Mars. How, how do we, how are they going to live in space for that long amount of time? Can they? What are the other issues we need to be looking for? So these are kinds of questions that we can kind of work together on in, in, in addressing. So it's been a very valuable partnership. Um, and the other area I think that I mentioned um, that we work on, hopefully it'll advance. It's advancing on my screen, but it's not advancing there. The, the rocket did it, I think. I'm not sure what to do. Yeah. Your battery is running low. All right, there we go. Thank you. Uh, so hopefully we'll get that battery resolved, but... Um, all right, so so another area, as I mentioned, is, is rare diseases. Uh, NCATS is a home for rare diseases, but we don't do this alone. Rare diseases affect just about every uh, system, organ, disease that NIH studies. And so we partner with, with uh, uh, over uh, 10 or 11 different institutes and centers across the NIH to really help us address um, issues around rare diseases. But what, what I wanted to tell you here is, is why are rare diseases so important? And I know I probably don't need to tell this audience, but but understanding the sort of magnitude of the economic burden of rare diseases is important. We did a study where we looked at individual medical costs for people with a rare disease. And, and when we compared them to people without a rare disease, we found that, that those medical costs were three to five times higher in rare disease patients than in non-rare disease patients. And when you add that on to the number of rare diseases that we have in this country, about 25 to 30 million, 
that translates into uh, uh, total or uh, sorry, um, uh, medical costs of around $400 billion per year for the rare disease population. Now, when you add on to that, the, the home care needed, the hospitalizations needed, and, and other care associated with um, not necessarily direct medical costs, but more indirect medical costs, that goes up to a trillion dollars per year in total costs for the rare disease population. So this is a public health challenge that we have. And so one of the areas that, that we're interested in, in developing is, is a, a quintessentially a, a platform-based kind of program. So we're not looking at one disease here for rare diseases, but we're counting on the fact that given that there are um, over 10,000 rare diseases, about 80% of those are caused by a single gene mutation, a single gene disorder. So with that information, we know that perhaps gene therapy, gene editing, antisense oligonucleotides, these sorts of genetically driven modalities for treatments could become very significant for rare disease populations. So if we develop a platform-based approach for these sorts of modalities for therapeutics, then perhaps that could democratize the ability for more people to be developing these sorts of therapeutics for those. And so we have three different programs in this in this area, and I've given you QR codes because I'm not going to be able to do any of them justice. Um, but uh, they're in various stages of development. Some are more on the on the on the uh, development side, some are getting more closely uh, to the clinical trial side, and um, and, and that will be significant, I think. And, and we're uh, the last one here. We're about a year out from our first clinical trial for a gene therapy, where we're we're using the same AAV virus for two different gene therapy genes to see if 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 we can streamline then the ability of de developing uh, the streamlined approaches for regulatory understanding of the ther of the of the capsid delivery device, so that we can. Uh, create a way in which other people can learn and use templated approach for the regulatory development of the delivery mechanism, when they just need to focus on a the therapeutic mechanism. And so with that, perhaps you can cut down the time of that regulatory need with, with, with FDA approval. So that's one of the examples in how we're trying to explore the platform-based approaches for therapeutic development. We have other approaches in, in gene therapy through uh, an AMP program, Bespoke Gene Therapy Consortium, and then we are also part of a common fund program for gene editing. And so if you'd like to learn more, um, please take a look at the, at the QR codes here. What I would also say here is that this is going to mean that we will need um, different workforce uh, communities to help us translate into um, that therapeutic development. And, and um, uh, that means nurses, that means pharmacy staff, that means st statisticians, et cetera. So this is going to be a, a key area for us moving forward. Um, I want to end on talking a little bit about the CTSA program. As I mentioned, we have 63 uh, different institutions across the country really focused on developing the infrastructure for what we do in this space. Um, and um, I also wanted to uh, tell you a little bit about the, the the population of nurses in the CTSA program. Uh, we have four PIs with nursing degrees. We have 43 CTSA institutions that have and are associated with a nursing school. We have 24 with nursing degrees um, in terms of scholars and trainees, and I'm going to talk about a few of those. And then um, we also have a variety of pilot projects that are related to um, individuals who are who, with nursing degrees who are, who are supporting those projects with nursing interests. So I'm really excited to see the depth and breadth that we have within the CTSA program, um, and, and I think this allows us to have a lot of different um, potential opportunities for further collaboration. And this is uh, really what the CTSA program does, that they have these local strengths in their own communities, but they uh, collectively can, can enable nimble and rapid and robust responses to a national public health challenge, um, whether that be the opioid crisis, the pandemic, um, or, or community engagement needs, or telehealth and telemedicine, or, or working in genomics and, 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 and uh, rare diseases. Uh, to thinking more operationally in building a, uh, an IRB platform that can be more streamlined. And that's those are some of the areas that we've helped to support. Um, but I think the, the graph on the upper right-hand hand corner there um, is, is really focused on wearable devices. And I'll, I want to get to why I wanted to highlight that in just a moment. I want to first touch on 
um, some of the community engagement activities that the CTSA program does, because I think this is, again, another area where um, partnerships in this space are, are going to be critical. We can't do this alone. The CTSAs can't do this alone. And, and other programs that we have across the NIH can't do this alone. So um, one of the programs that we have within the CTSA program is a trial innovation network. And uh, everywhere from designing of a clinical trial to dissemination and outreach, uh, we have a variety of tools and resources that can help people uh, plan and develop the, the full gamut of what that might entail. And so some of those resources are shown in that QR code above. But really thinking about the value proposition that we can bring to communities, this is part of, of what we're trying to do. And then I want to give a, a little bit of a, a rendition of um, a sort of a compelling story. And the QR code for that video is shown here too. Um, this is Deborah o Oto Kent, and she's a community advisory board member of one of the CTSA programs at UC Davis. And she was part of a National Academy study. And in this video, she talks about the idea of, of going into a community that was documented as a food desert. And when she went into the community to talk about these issues of being in a food desert, what she found was that the food desert was not at all a problem. It was actually that the community doesn't feel safe walking in the parks, walking across the street. The sidewalks are, are broken and cracked. You can't push strollers down, down them. These, are, these simple fixes are, would go a long way to enhancing the communities out there and enabling them to be more self-sufficient and, and, uh, and, and perhaps not being mislabeled as being in a food desert instead of being in a very vibrant community. So these are the kinds of things that she talks about in this video, but also areas in where the CTSA program can go out into the community and really try to learn these sorts of things. Now, another key um, uh, program is one that, that Dr. Zank leads through the Common Fund program called COMPASS. And we have just recently um, uh, supplemented uh, an award uh, through our CTSA program through the Meharry Vanderbilt Community Engaged Research Corps. Um, and, and I'm really thrilled to see that we're pulling together these, these, the expertise here um, that's needed, not just through the CTSA program, but from what the Compass is building as well. And so we're gonna learn, our communities are gonna learn from one another and be able to build a stronger way to enhance the kind of community engagements that are needed. Now, I want to just give you a few diff additional highlights from the CTSA program from, from the nursing standpoint. Um, you probably have heard some of these stories already, but so I won't spend too much time on them, but I'm pretty proud of them. Um, this one is uh, Shanina Knighton, who um, is uh, uh, thinking about ways to enhance um, hand hygiene and self-management of older adults. So putting, you know, basically these hygiene equipment on, on hospital beds. It's brilliant, easy and brilliant. Um, so, so she was the winner of a 40 under 40 leader in minority health award. Um, so, so I'm super thrilled that she's getting recognized in that way. And another, uh, another one, a successful story I think is, is Alexis Dunamori. Um, she's a certified nurse midwife and she's recently explored the interconnection between maternal mortality crisis that we have in the U.S. and COVID. And this is an area of continued importance for NIH and advancing and improving maternal health. And then I'd also like to highlight two, um, two scholars, nursing scholars at, at Rockefeller. Um, the, uh, the one on top here is Dr. Um, Polly Joseph, who um, is doing research on taste and smell disorders. And it turns out that was pretty important during the pandemic. So we were able to learn a lot from her in this space. And then the one on the bottom, uh, Dr. Um, Dr. Um, Godzik is looking at older adults and sleep patterns as well. So these are, these are critical things for um, our communities to be able to continue to, to support. And I, I also want to just highlight as well the, the impact of wearables. I think I teased a little bit about this idea of, of wearables here. Um, uh, the, one of the aspects of the CTSA program and, and the Georgia CTSA is quintessential in this area of working on the HAP hatchery, we call it, is developing wearables and, and mobile technologies. Um, and, and I think that there's a lot of work in this space to fill gaps that are needed um, to, to monitor potential uh, disease progression or activities. And this one in particular is addressing language barriers for people who are out in communities and have difficulties in interacting with patients. And so this is an app that is meant to help address that. But there are many apps that are being generated to, to fill these certain gaps. And, and I'm showing two more here. One is on uh, from the Scripps Research Institute on looking at symptoms 
of COVID and, and symptoms of COVID along with using digital health technologies. And it turns out that if you use both symptoms and digital health technologies, you get more confidence in the results. Um, looking at sleep patterns, I mentioned this was a, a, a key um, issue in one of the fellows work that was being done. Um, this one is, is looking at um, comparing sleep wearables and again, evaluating the different wearables that we have out there for sleep um, and the growing confidence in looking at digital health technologies and how they're able to uh, tell us that, that a, a lot more detail about our sleep patterns and how that might affect our health. So these are just a few areas that I think are, are really interesting and can add a lot of value to what we're doing and bringing in the data. But what I'm super excited about is um, when we looked at a variety of the digital health technologies across the NIH, what we found is that if you look at the percent of NIH funding by IC in the digital health space um, over the last seven years, it turns out who's the one on top? It's NINR. NINR is leading the way in this space. Um, now, that said, if you don't do it by percent of funding for IC, uh, there are other ICs that that are bigger and 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 also fund in this space. But but what it tells me is that that there's a there there. We're interested in the there there. You're interested in the there there. How do we uh, how do we think about this as fertile ground to continue to develop perhaps pathways for partnerships and collaboration in areas of need? And how do we coordinate that effort? Uh, and really align to certain goals that we think are really valuable. How do we prioritize that work and really put our sights on it? So uh, that's uh, a little bit about what NCATS does. Um, and again, we don't do this alone. We really need the partnerships that we have across the NIH and, and HHS, plus other stakeholders across the community. Um, we are undergoing a strategic plan development, and um, this is, you don't need to read this slide. The QR code is there if you're interested in our strategic plan and our development of that. Um, we have gone through over about 40 different roundtables, meeting with our stakeholders across the communities, patients, patient advocacy groups, community uh, advisory boards, et cetera, the public. Um, and we're at the point now where we have a uh, request for information written. It's standing and waiting to be publicized. And I hope that I can call on you and Dr. Zink to forward it to you, perhaps, to give your input perhaps on what you might see as, as potential for interactions with NCATS and how we can start to build that into our strategic plan as well. Uh, so I, I ask for your help in that. And with that, I'm gonna end, and I know I'm probably over time, but uh, ask you if you, happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rudder. So I've asked uh, Dr. Cindy Monroe, uh, to lead us in discussion, Cindy. Thank you so much for your very informative presentation. And I, I really appreciated the highlights of how nursing research intersects with the work of NCATS. Uh, and I noted that one of the key NCATS approaches involves leveraging similarities across diseases. Uh, nursing research has been well positioned to contribute because it focuses on people's lives and living conditions addressing health and public health through a lens of social determinants of health. Mm -hmm. And that can be applied across a spectrum of important health mm -hmm. problems that people face. Yes. I continued to be struck by the observation that for pharmacologic in interventions, the time from development to medicine cabinet is 10 to 15 years or more. And that's a figure that really hasn't improved over many years. We're stuck at that number. Um, and I think speeding that the delivery of effective treatments to the people who need them is a really important goal. Uh, I would note that nursing interventions often target risk factors, protective factors, and resilience. Yep. And so nurse scientists propose health solutions that can be tested and implemented more quickly than pharmacotherapeutic approaches. Um, you referred to the hand hygiene for older hospitalized adults as easy and brilliant. So thank you for that, uh, for that label. I think nursing science has a clear path to assist in advancing the goals of NCATS to get more treatments to all people more quickly, particularly if we take a broad view of helpful yeah. interventions. Yeah. Um, as you also presented, nurse scientists make significant contributions to the CTSA national network. And in turn, CTSAs have supported the development of the pipeline of nurse scientists and enhanced interdisciplinary team science. And that's a tradition that I hope will continue. 
Um, my question is about uh, the examples that you provided of the excellent projects that have been done in the CTSAs. Um, noting the numbers, uh, 43 CTSA institutions have a nursing school. That's out of about 60, right? So that's, that's right. Two thirds of yeah. them have a nursing school associated with them. Um, and I wondered about the number of scholars and trainees, 24 with nursing degrees. How does that compare to the overall total number of trainees? <laughs> I don't know the answer to that question. Um, there, uh, it, it, the CTSA program trains a lot of trainees. So it's probably on the lower side. Um, and so with the, with the idea that there are uh, many nursing schools associated with CTSAs, perhaps that that's an area that we can uh, really draw from and build more from. And I think that is, uh, uh, that that's, that's there. That's something that we could do very easily in making those connections. Um, and so I think what we could do is, is understand how we can better um, navigate and make aware the nursing schools that there are opportunities that are associated with the CTSA program for uh, scholarly development in in a variety of activities that are needed in the infrastructure that we support for clinical research. So I think this is this is a a, a key thing that we can do. But I, you know the, the other thing that you you're pointing to as well is that perhaps those 24 people can be ambassadors back to the nursing schools and talk about what they do in the, in in the in the training that they receive through the CTSA program. And maybe that's another way that we can highlight that even more. And I think, um, for example, we have a CTSA at University of Miami, and um, we are very well connected with it in terms of the programs that are offered and those kinds of things. But I'm not certain that the number of trainees that we have is representative of our right. of our population of right. scientists. Yeah, and and it it's a competitive environment. Um, and so, what are the things that we can do to help support um, individuals who are interested in becoming? Uh, trainees, uh, I think awareness is going to be the biggest thing. Um, but how we really make sure that there those are those are connections that are known and understood. How to get it, how to get into those programs? Seems like that's something that we could do. Thank you. Would love it, any additional thoughts you have on that as well. Uh, if you wouldn't mind emailing me, or if you do have thoughts in the future, of perhaps how your your school is thinking about that. Thank you. And that, my other question is about, um, I thought it was really intriguing that uh, when you talked about the gene targeted delivery program, you talked about it really needing a very broad representation from the healthcare workforce. Mm -hmm. um, and in addition to the role of nurses in perhaps translating that to mm -hmm. people who are in the clinical trials, what would you see as the role of nursing science in that? Uh, I that's a that's a great question. I think there's there's a, a large role, you know, in in terms of of clinical trials in these new modalities that we're using for gene therapy, for example, we're seeing, uh, you know, it's been a rocky road for the last twenty years in looking at gene therapies, right? And um, we don't know necessarily um, the the safety and efficacy of these gene therapies. We think we know the efficacy probably a little bit more. But the safety, I think, is still is still um, we want to make sure that we have the uh, the view of the holistic person when we're thinking about care, even it's even if it's for a therapy for uh, um, a disease on metabolism, for example, there may be um, issues that that arise because of the therapy itself. Um, the the viral vectors that we use are are non immunogenic but they're really not non-immunogenic. And so what they do to perhaps organs and organ systems, um, we, we can see toxicities in organ systems that, that were unexpected. Um, might that be because of underlying conditions? So how can, how can we understand more about the sy symptomatology of disease, I think is one area. But then another area is just for the care itself and um, understanding that you know, we might be treating a particular disease, but we need to be looking for things that we aren't expecting. And we can do that through the care. And um, that's going to get us part way, but not all the way, of course. Um, and and I think that's those are areas where 
um, intersections with with nursing schools and and training nurses in this space could be really critical to really help ensure that we're we have the ability to care for just about any outcome that could arise um, in these kinds of uh, research clinical research or clinical trials. Um, so I think that's one of the key things that I would see is is really making sure we train a workforce that can handle um, unexpected problems in that way with these new modalities that we don't know what to expect. Thank you. You're welcome. That was, a, that was an amazing overview. Thank you so much. Yes. Um, I saw a lot of emphasis on preclinical mm -hmm. and clinical efficacy work. Um, where do you see effectiveness falling within NCATS? Because so many of the therapies that we develop that are efficacious actually fail um, That's from right. effectiveness perspective. Yeah. So, so again, primarily in, in those predictive models, it's not just predicting safety, but it's also predicting efficacy. So what we can do is put, for example, um, disease primary cells from people with particular diseases on these chips and, and understand how those compare to people perhaps without the disease and look at therapeutic development um, by, play, by um, infusing those therapies on the chips to look at biomarker development, for example, to think about how efficacy might be affected. Are we seeing a decrease in a biomarker that's normally increased in a particular disease by treating it with, with a variety of different therapies? So that's one way we're able to look at those. At, at those. And, and now with the FDA Modernization Act 2.0, which actually reduces the use of, of animal models, in IND enabling studies, I'm gonna, I, I predict that these kinds of more physiologically relevant in vitro systems will, will become a little bit more elevated in how we can really look at that, at that efficacy side uh, for, um, for regulatory packages that could be approved by the FDA. I think we're a little bit away from that right now. There, there still needs to be a lot more validation and experimental um, work done, but I think that that's, that's the wave of the future. Okay. Well, uh, thank you so much again for this uh, wonderful conversation. And I look forward to uh, perhaps intersecting with you uh, more at another time. And please, please, please give us your input on the, um, on the request for information that's gonna come out shortly. Thank you again, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rudder. Always great to see you. Uh, appreciate you joining us. Looking forward to talking more. Um, thank you. So um, we are going to take a break. Um, so uh, let's uh, regroup at 1050 Eastern. All right, thanks. Thank you. Well, I think I was so excited to get the meeting underway. Uh, that I neglected to call for a vote on the minutes from the last council meeting. So we'll do that now. Uh, minutes of the May meeting were made available to you on the electronic council book for your review. May I have a motion to approve? Move to approve. Thank you. Second? Second. Second. Any discussion? Okay, any opposed? The motion carries, thank you. Also for the minutes, I would like to note that Dr. Atkins is present and also that Dr. Beckemeyer, in addition to Dr. Johnson and Dr. Prevencio Vasquez was unable to be with us today, thank you. Okay, well, good morning again. Uh, I am delighted uh, to introduce our next speaker. So our next speaker is Dr. Cheryl Boyce, who will share updates on the Community Partnerships to Advance Science for Society Initiative, or COMPASS. So Dr. Boyce is the Assistant Director for Re-Engineering the Research Enterprise Office of Strategic Coordination at the NIH Common Fund. In this role, she directs novel, transformative programs focused on translational science, community-driven research, 
social determinants of health, and inclusive excellence in academic and research training. She previously served as the first permanent chief of the implementation science branch at NHLBI. Uh, during over two decades of public service, she has held scientific leadership positions with the NIHOD, NIDA, the National Institute of Mental Health, as well as in the Office of National Drug Control Policy within the Office of the President. She completed her PhD at UNC Chapel Hill, holds psychology licensure in Maryland and DC, and is an American Psychological Association Fellow. Dr. Boyce, welcome, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, it's truly a pleasure to be here today. Um, and some of you may know that um, in terms of the Nursing Institute, they are one of the proud sponsors of, of COMPASS in terms of an initiative. And I join you from the NIH Common Fund. And I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the Common Fund, because when we talk about common, it's in terms of common interest across NIH. But the NIH Common Fund is not as common as we'd like it in terms of those who know about the opportunities. So while I'm not talking about um, Common Fund in terms of all the programs, I really encourage you, maybe I can come back and talk about some of those opportunities because there are really a lot of innovative opportunities for individual investigators in terms of pioneering and high risk reward research that I hope many of those uh, who are watching today or here in the room can pursue in the future. And I also come to you as the proud um, daughter of a nurse. Uh, my mother was a public health nurse in New York City back in the day and a midwife in Trinidad and Tobago. I am first generation born here. And so I am a daughter of a nurse and now I'm a clinical psychologist, but um, it's really a pleasure to be here at the Nursing Institute. I know that she is looking down upon me and very proud that I'm finally doing what I should have done all along. And <laughs> and hang out with more nurses. Um, so I, I finally got it right. So thank you, Shannon, for allowing me this opportunity. Um, in terms of COMPASS, what is COMPASS? So COMPASS stands for the Community Partnerships to Advance Science for Society. And we hope that we're going in the right direction, COMPASS, and we're doing something that really is focused on health equity. But in focusing on health equity, we're doing something that's community-led. And when we started Compass, everyone was talking about, I would go place and they said, I heard NIH is funding communities doing something community led. And I was like, what's that? Oh, I said, oh, you mean Compass? Because it was so novel and it was really different. NIH has funded community research in the past. We've had community-based participatory research programs, but we really have never had a large effort that was community led and something that leveraged multi-sectoral partnerships. And what's important about COMPASS and very relevant to the initiatives of NINR is that it's intervening on social determinants of health. And in terms of leaders of social determinants of health at NIH, of course, um, Dr. Shannon Zank, and of course at NIMHD, Eliseo um, is also leading some of the efforts on social determinants of health. So we really are starting to build this area in many different ways to make an impact. And in terms of intervening, we're looking to improve health outcomes, reduce health disparities, and also advance health equity. We're going to leverage those structural interventions in terms of changing and informing systems and policies and making a difference. Our research is not policy research, but we're really getting the evidence that can inform policy research. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how we're going to do that with COMPASS. Now, what makes Common Fund different is that when we say common, it is really bringing together something that's unique that one institute does not do alone. It makes substantial investments, it's time limited, it's really goal driven, and it's to change the trajectory. It's something that brings together the interests of many institutes at once, and it's to move something at a quick pace. It's to remove research roadblocks. We focus on enhancing the research work workforce and supporting high reward science. The requirements for a program in Common Fund are that it needs to catalyze discovery. And in doing that, we're really doing something at a fast pace that if one or two institutes try to do, they just couldn't do. And you'll see how in terms of how we're doing Compass. Our co-chairs, as I've mentioned, we're very proud to have 
the director of NIR, as well as directors from National Institute of Mental Health, National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities, and the director of the Office of Research on Women's Health. And we also formerly had the director of Tribal Health Research Office as one of our co-chairs who really informed a lot of what we did in terms of outreach to the populations who have been underrepresented in research and in community-led interventions. Now, when I say this is an NIH-wide effort, this is just the working group. Um, we also have so many others who are serving as subject matter experts who are going to be project officers, project scientists. And I did highlight some of the NINR staff who are working directly in terms of the work group. And um, really important is the grants management and review because we did some really novel things in terms of how we have managed review in terms of thinking about lived experience and grants management in terms of thinking about the mechanisms that really work for communities and, and to make a difference in terms of how we can fund things involving communities and to have an impact. So I want to thank all of the work group members, all of our co-chairs, and our Carmen Fund staff, as well as those who especially are at NINR. So the goals of COMPASS, the first one, is to catalyze, deploy, and evaluate community-led health equity structural interventions that leverage partnerships across multiple sectors to reduce health disparities. Now, the second goal is very different, and that is to develop a new health equity research model for community-led multi-sectoral structural intervention research across NIH and other federal agencies. Now, that second one is very different. That's not typically the type of goal you see in an NIH kind of mission statement or for an initiative. And that is because we felt that it was very important that not only do we have interventions that make an impact, but that for this really to change how NIH does business, how can we really leave an impact in terms of models for community-led research that could serve across institutes in the future. So part of what we do in Common Fund will also have an evaluation component of the way that we are running the mechanism, how we're involving communities, so that institutes can continue to think about involving community-led research in their research programs in the future in an effective way. Now, how are we going to put this all together in terms of the types of programs? So it's going to be 10 years, and we fund in five-year increments. The first five years are $153 million, and it's broken down into three components. Now, the first components are the intervention in the community. We fondly call them the CHISIs, and those are community-led health equity structural interventions. What we're using for those are other trans, um, other transaction awards. And I'm not sure if anybody has heard of those before. Um, you tr usually you're used to cooperative agreements. You may have heard of you know, your typical research awards, contracts, training awards. Other transaction awards have been used in government in the past, but they have been more recently at NIH um, authorized to be used. And because they're more flexible, they have um, some features that are really attractive for us to work with communities. We also will have something called Health Equity Research Hubs. And we're going to have five of those awards, and that's through an RFA that's currently out. So there's opportunities there. The Chessy Awards announcement has closed. And then we also, of course, will have a coordinating center. And that's going to be one award, and that's soon to be announced as well. That announcement is closed. So these comp three components will come together to form the consortium for the COMPASS. Now, first, let's talk a little bit more about these CHESIs, the Community-Led Health Equity Structural Interventions. For those interventions, we will have a three-phased approach. The first two years, and the first stage is planning. And that is to pilot, to plan the structural interventions, capacity and partnership building, and to develop what we are calling the local health equity research assembly. 
Now, what is a HERA? What we decided is that it's going to be important. I'm an implementation scientist, and you need to really think about implementation from the start. You can't wait until you finish the project and said, okay, here, let's go disseminate and implement it, and let's go fund another implementation science project to get it all done, and we hope that what we did was going to work for you. We want to think about that from the start. So in having a health equity research assembly, as you design the intervention, you are thinking about the partners in terms of in terms of the intervention, the community, the policy, anybody that would be needed for the intervention to work and would be needed for future implementation. And that consists of your local health equity research assembly. We also will have that at the national level because in terms of what we can bring to this project as a true collaboration, we can bring to bear the national level resources and connections in order to facilitate success. Now, the second phase is the implementation. And that's where the communities will have the structural interventions. They will use their local Harris, and they will be able to work on the interventions that will influence health outcomes across multiple health conditions and diseases. Now, in the last two years, in years nine and 10, we have dissemination. We really assess the health impacts, look at the findings, and think about sustainability. And that's often something that we just don't build into grants. And that's something that's very important in terms of the mission of this initiative. And to plan for the structural interventions to stay. Now, the awards are going to be named um, soon. I'm, unfortunately, I'm not allowed to tell you yet what they are, but um, when the press release is available, we will make sure you have those available to you. But I do want to tell you that they are across all the social determinants of health areas and that they will be awarded this month before the end of the fiscal year. And to tell you a little bit about how we were able to get to the 25 awards that will be named. The scientific review was very different and we incorporated the community and those with lived experience. We did not use the Center for Scientific Review. We ran the review ourselves and did pilot a different type of review and used almost um, up to 200 reviewers um, to be able to, be able to um, assess the number of grants we had, which was um, I, let's just say very overwhelming. Uh, we had a wonderful response. While we can't tell you the exact number of grants, we can tell you what was publicly available. We started out with just having a couple of technical assistance uh, webinars, but the response was so great with the first one where we had almost uh, 800 people attending the webinar, um, we had to add six more. Um, we had eight technical assistance webinars and we had up, um, and at the end, um, 20, over 2,400 participants on our webinars to learn about COMPASS. So we do think um, that communities were kind of waiting and ready for this type of announcement. And we think that they have been waiting for NIH to do this for a while. And just in our videos alone on YouTube, we made sure that everything was very accessible. The minute that we posted the announcement. We had pre-recorded videos. We wanted to make sure people could get access to everything right away and watch it over and over. And they did over 3,300 3, views. They watched it over and over. So we have not only had this announcement, we've done a lot of education and capacity building for learning about NIH, learning about the process for community members who did not have exposure to NIH, may have had other types of grants like such as CDC or or other agencies, but really learning about NIH and community research partnerships that are available. Now, the Chessy Awards have a scientific focus across all the social determinants areas. They all have a strong approach for community-aged research and have high potential impact for health equity. I can tell you that they have a broad representation across populations. There's a broad geographic distribution of projects and we'll have an inclusion of high and low resource community organizations. 
and they also focus on healthcare, chronic disease, nutrition research priorities. And the other criteria we have for the awards we're going to make is that they are ready to conduct structural intervention research. These two years of intervention development are for communities and research partners that are ready. The grants are going to communities, but they chose their research partner, which is very different. And we know that this is a model that has not been used at NIH before. Now, in terms of the coordination center, there's going to be one single coordination center, and that's going to do the program management, um, the administrative work, the capacity building, the partnership and training. And we're very excited that part of this is going to be research capacity building and training, and the resources are going to be made available to all as much as possible. That, too, is going to be awarded this month. And those three components are uh, very important in terms of not only building for the sites, but the idea is to make some of these resources available as much as possible for future communities and to really build a resource in terms of data that's available so that community research can build not only at NIH, but for other partner agencies. Now, some of the work that they're going to do is to think about how we can use common data elements where possible and to make sure that communities think, how can we fit into the NIH policies like data management? How does that really translate for communities? Those have been the big roadblocks in terms of NIH rigor and policies. How can we translate and make that easier for them? These are some of the important roadblocks that they have identified. And the National Health Equity Research Assembly is also an important part. That will have not only subject matter experts, but federal agency representatives who we've already assembled and will continue to assemble, nonprofit foundations who are interested in the same mission areas, and the funded awardees. For example, if there is a project that is looking at a social determinants of health area that impacts housing, then we have a federal partner in HUD that would be on our national hero, who could identify local and regional resources to help advance the project and contribute to its success. Similarly, for nutrition, we have a federal partner at USDA that can help not only the project, but think about down the line, what does it mean for sustainability? So we are thinking from the start about implementation and sustainability, as well as trying to advance the, the mission and think about the success of the individual project. Now, the hubs is a new way of thinking about hubs. Usually, we think about hubs for data, or we might think of it just for training. But we're thinking about hubs as collaborative support between the coordination center and the sites. With communities, we, we realize that the typical data coordination center might not be able to do it all. We might need additional support additional subdramatic expertise. So there are going to be five hubs that are going to assist the Chessies in terms of thinking about research capacity building and training and community engagement. So in addition to their research partners, the Chessies and the intervention sites will also have hubs to go to. So we really are building in an infrastructure for the community um, intervention sites that will really support them for success. And in terms of the hubs, now that announcement is still out right now. So there are, is an opportunity. And the letter of intent, which is optional, is due at the end of the month. And the application deadline is October 31st. And the webinar and all the materials are online right now. And that is that was staged to come a little later on purpose so that the intervention in the coordinating center started first. Now, in addition to all of that, we had such a resounding success that we built a lot of community partners that partnered with researchers, and we had this network of people that we really didn't want to leave behind. We're only funding 25 sites. And in terms of the mission, as you remember, that second mission area was really to think about the way that NIH builds community-led research. So in thinking about that, 
we tried to identify what we could do to really build that network. And there are a lot of efforts going on throughout NIH, but we wanted to think about the network we built and how to really galvanize efforts across different parts of NIH. Because again, we try to think in a common way. So one of those efforts has been the SEAL network that has been very important during COVID. It's led by NIHD and NHLBI and has really galvanized a lot of efforts during COVID and has really shifted and has continued to lead community engagement efforts. And as part of that, they have a consultative resource. So as part of COMPASS, we are building a consultative resource and we're supplementing SEAL to consult with the network we built. And those are the people who didn't get funded, but the network we built through all of the efforts of COMPASS and the webinars and all those who applied but didn't get funded, the network we built, we are going to have workshops and other activities to continue building those community and research partnerships so that they continue to think about funding and projects in the future. So that will be happening in the next year. So we have a consultative arm of Compass that's in partnership with SEAL that will be starting. And as Joni just presented, we are really excited because NCATS now has these wonderful engagement cores um, through the CTSAs as she presented, that we are, have this great new collective for community engagement. And partnering with NCATS, we hope to really connect communities to the different NCAT sites and to build out meetings and to hear from the communities and to continue to build resources on community engagement with the Meharry Vanderbilt Community Engaged Research Corps, which had long um, history of really um, designing engagement studios, a lot of tools that could be useful for the network we have built. So while we're going to build more of those things through Compass, we felt that there was a need now to really assist the network that we had built in gearing up for Compass and to not leave those behind that don't receive awards because of the large network and the capacity we had already built in terms of communities identifying research partners just to apply for the award and to think about what they could do. We wanted to really leverage those rich partnerships that have been built as part of Compass. So we are not leaving anyone behind. We're engaging them, even if they don't get awards, um, through these different types of opportunities to continue to build and to continue to build capacity across NIH. So we hope that will lead to future applications to the benefit of all of NIH in terms of community-driven and community-partnered research. So those are two late-breaking um, opportunities that we have in terms of Compass for that second goal, which is not typical for our initiatives. Now, finally, I'm really excited about this Challenge Grant, and I'm not sure how many of you know about Challenge Grants, but these are opportunities to really give a prize um, and think about ways to get great ideas from the public. And the only requirement for the DIS Challenge Grant is that you have to be 18 years old and it can come from anyone in the public. I encourage, um, sometimes we do these for students. I've done challenge grants before. There are a lot of people with great ideas. Um, community members can take part of this. We're really excited. I really would love to see a community member win one of these awards because I think they're an untapped resource. And who better to say, how do we build community trust than a community member? So we are co-funding the Build Up Trust Challenge, which is led by NHLBI and co-funded by the All of Us Research Program, um, NID, NIBIB, NIEHS, and NINDS. And the prizes are pretty good. We're giving up over a million dollars and you can win like $40,000 um, for a great idea. We love great ideas. And the Build Up Trust Challenge um, you just have to register by November 14th. They even have tools there to help you think about your idea. Um, this is all really to get the best ideas out of us. And it's a great, it's a great thing. I mean, you can get people in your house. You, it's a really great thing for students, for community members to really sit there and think about what are the ways that we need to think about 
to build up true trust and improve engagement. This is one of our biggest challenges in terms of NIH is trust. And we need new ideas. And so what better way than to say, how about let's give you a prize? Um, we know as a psychologist, we know prizes do work. Um, so I really encourage you to um, think about disseminating this to all that you know. And um, I, I mean, I don't get a percentage of the prize, but I would love to, to hear later on. I'm so glad you told me about that. We won. Um, so I would love to, to, to hear that someone in one of your community members won the prize or someone from your team or someone, one of your students won this prize. Um, some of the best, some of the best ideas have come from students um, in terms of them working together. And so it would be great. I can't wait to see who wins and what the ideas are going to be because I, I just can't imagine some of the things that we just haven't thought about in terms of building trust because of where we sit and that we just can't see some of the things that we're missing. So with that, I'm, I'm going to close. I'm really excited about Compass. I'm excited about making the awards announcement soon. I feel like I'm just holding this great um, joy in and we have a lot of work to do and we're going to need everyone's great ideas and, and partnership. And I personally want to thank um, Shannon Zank. She has really pushed us um, to think outside the box and to really think strongly about making an impact in terms of social terms of health and, and multi-sectoral um, partnerships and structural interventions and is leading a lot of that work here at NIH. Um, so with that, I will close and I'm happy to take um, comments and some questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Boyce. Uh, Dr. Ayala. Oh, Dr. Boyce, I've been waiting for this presentation my whole life. I'm so grateful that NIH is stepping into this area and in such a bold way in terms of the number of uh, mechanisms that they're going to be, or a number of um, awards that they're going to be funding. So just to recap quickly, um, Dr. Boyce presented on the Compass Initiative, which is really a cool approach that, a new approach that NIH is taking to try and identify um, particularly systems and potentially policy relevant changes for hopefully sustainable changes in the way healthcare is delivered um, and other ways of preventing and controlling uh, the numerous chronic conditions that are affecting people's lives. Um, I appreciated the whole discussion on involving a national and local um, health equity research assembly, but that's also one of my first questions. How is an assembly different from or similar to a coalition or advisory committee that many of us are kind of accustomed to having on our projects? Oh, that, that's a very good question. So um, I think, you know, those are often self-defined. Um, we, we often hear of advisory boards from communities. We, we purposely, you know, didn't name it that. Um, we thought very, we thought a lot about what to call it. And we wanted to make it very much of a, kind of a grassroots and a, a very, a, a body that really was about helping. And um, it doesn't have any kind of power in the usual way in terms of it's not having direction. I mean, they're going to be those kind of bodies that are part of a grant and typical structure. We really wanted to have a body that brought together um, different groups that aren't typically in such a thing and to really have the emphasis on the sustainability piece as well as the research piece and the policy piece in a way that was unique. Um, I think coalitions, um, they're often, you know, people define them in many different ways. So we need to do something different. But this was really very much on what do you need for success and aim very much on the paths for sustainability and more of an implementation science model. It, it does come more from the tradition of well, when global health and implementation science. And so that's what we modeled more so for. Um, we also really were concerned about communities having resources because of the way that we're doing this as a collaborative. How could we build in some kind of body um, that allowed for local and national resources from other agencies, mm. uh, local okay. agencies. So that's why we did it in that way. Um, and as part of the submission for the for the you know, coordinating centers, um, 
they did lay out how they're going to do it. So we did give some flexibility. Um, sec next question is really related to evaluation. So I see obviously that they're going to be evaluating the structural interventions on whatever the outcomes might be. But I know as somebody who leads a center, several center grants, the expectations mm -hmm. of additional extramural funding and publications, these are not necessarily things that the prime institutes or prime institutions that are getting this money are normally tasked with trying to accomplish. So are there other ways of evaluating that NIH is going to be taking on yes. how successful these are? And are those metrics part of it or not? They are. Uh, as part of common fund, I mean, there's additional metrics. I mean, there's a really clear plan. Um, the metrics are not, not only publications. We have different kinds of metrics. I mean, for capacity building, I mean, the metric is not public pub, publication. I mean, the metrics are going to be dissemination of materials, um, evaluation materials. We have consultants which will review the materials. So it is very different in terms of the way that we have a, a very detailed implementation plan in terms of the project, which are different. So I, I think that goes to the second aim in terms of why there's not only a uh, an aim for does the do the interventions work or not? And will they be sustainable or not? There's also an aim about how do these different components work? Because for Compass, some of the deliverables per se are really, does this whole thing work right. as much as can we say this works or doesn't work and why, mm -hmm. so that we can advise NIH on how will it proceed um, as an institute for using and um, using different types of mechanisms in how they involve communities in the future in really thinking about translational research and effectiveness research and implementation research for for different um, health areas. I'm hopeful that there are folks with some process evaluation expertise. Yes. It would be great to be involved because I think having done some of these complex interventions, I often find that there's a, a key component that gets translated and not the whole thing, but it actually creates a system change to improve quality of care. So it wasn't necessarily mm -hmm. the whole package that even mattered, right? but it was just a component of it. But we really found that through process evaluation more than actually through the implementation of the trial. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my last question, Dr. Boyce, is really related to translation of some of the approaches that have been taking with Compass mm -hmm. and how that might influence the way things are done at NIH as it relates to extramural awards. So you mentioned, as one example, the OTA is a more mm -hmm. flexible. Can you talk a little bit more about that and the extent to which it may then move into funding academic institutions? Right. So OTAs were, uh, have been used at other government agencies, such as like DARPA. I mean, they've been used um, at other agencies in the past. And NIH got the authority. Not all institutes have used them. I mean, it's new and it re requires different capacity in terms of staff. Um, so um, different like all of us has used them. It was used during COVID. So I think as NIH has tried to tackle new types of problems, they've felt what are new types of mechanisms we can use to, to use to tackle those problems. And that's what, what we did. So we are keeping track of kind of the, of course there have been some challenges. And so as we solve them, I mean, we kind of have a community practice with other parts of NIH. And that's part of our mission is to say what works and doesn't work so that other institutes will consider using them for the next type of problem they have or when they have a objective in terms of health that they say, well, why don't we try an OTA and see if that would work better? So in terms of flexibility, it's very milestone driven um, for communities with those, <laughs> we had listening sessions and early on, you know, communities said first, you know, we want to be in charge. We want to ha we want to ask the question that's mm -hmm. relevant for our community. We think it's very nice when researchers want to partner with us, but it's not so nice when they come in with the question they think we want answered. So that's why we wanted a mechanism where they would get the funds and they would then get a research partner. And the OTA has a different kind of structure in terms of how they, they actually apply. Mm -hmm. So that's why we did it that way. There are different steps. Okay. So we were able to help in terms of that. The application process was considered a very 
big roadblock um, at NIH. So that's why we thought about it. And then we also thought about the way that the milestones were driven, that being a high risk, high reward type of project, that we also need to have um, very close eyes on, on this as well. Um, because we do want success, but we also need to have a close eye in terms of uh, scrutiny. Um, it's a new project, and we really do want to make sure it's successful. So that's why we, we're using OTA. It's very closely mi milestone driven and more reporting, whereas typically if you have a grant, as you know, once a year we hear from you. Um, that's not the way this is going to work. We're going to be hearing from them much more frequently, and it also will help because if they need help, we can kind of shift it. Or if we need to change the milestones, we can do that. It's very difficult to do that with the structure of grants, mm -hmm. as, you, as you know, when you have to call your project officer. It's not so easy to, to shift and move. Mm -hmm. um, we want to help communities do that and help guide for success. Excellent. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. I have a question for you. And I'm sure that a lot of thought went into this, but um, as a grantee, which five-year grants are like, you know, a big deal if you get them. Ten years of funding, a lot's going to happen in ten years. We're in such a dynamic society, and things don't stay. I, you know, have you thought about how you're going to find what's working with mm -hmm. the changing environment and with changing cultural things that are happening? So we're so dynamic that mm -hmm. it's just. I was thinking about that ten-year timeline, and how do you? You know, what was the thought about that? So after five years, we do have to go back and ask for the next five years. So that is something I think about that. Where will we be in five years to say, let's keep going? So we will have to prove and go to our council and say, we will have to have some indication. So there is a checks and balances to go all the way to 10 years. Um, and I think with the OT, um, like if there's a site that isn't doing so well and needs to stop, then we'll be able to say you need to stop. Or if they need to, we need to adjust, we can do that. So it is more nimble. It's very hard to do that with the current structure of, of grants. Um, when you, you know, when you, you, we do now have some of those phased awards, which this is a little bit like that, that helps, but it is hard. So I, I do worry about 10 years. I think I think about 10 years ago and all the discovery we've had. Um, but we let's say there is a discovery, we can maybe bring that in. And we're hoping things like the hair, often because government is so big, we're in these silos. So if there's some new advance or something like that, we're hoping that some of the HERA would help with, with that in terms of if we know something's coming or that will affect um, the structure of, uh, in terms of some of these structural interventions, if something's changing in the structure, we need to know about that because that would affect the intervention, right? Any additional questions for Dr. Boyce? Well, thank you for having me. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Boyce. Um, I just want to recognize Dr. Boyce for her amazing leadership of this um, really high risk, high reward transformative program for NIH. Um, I've learned so much for you, appreciate your dedication and commitment. Um, and also want to recognize though this, uh, and Dr. Boyce is the first to say this, and it was shown on that slide, this is a huge undertaking for NIH. Um, we have so many at NINR, um, Dr. Shalanda Bynum from the very beginning helped us launch Compass. I want to recognize her. Yes, thank you. But also now so many at NINR are contributing to Compass, um, and also so many across the NIH. And it's really a labor of love. There is no amount of money, no amount of compensation that can um, compensate for the tremendous investment and commitment of this team. And so I want to acknowledge them. So thank you, Dr. Boyce. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we are very proud of that, um, that we'll be overseeing the coordination center. And so again, grants management uh, program, et cetera, are involved, uh, including Dr. Dion Godet uh, Greer, who is in the back. I see you, uh, Dion, uh, who has been so instrumental in so many others. I hate to name names because I forget people, so I'll leave it at that. But I want to acknowledge um, everybody's contributions. So thank you. So with that, I see my colleague, Dr. Susan Gregorick in the back. Make your way to the front, my friend. Um, so Dr. Susan Gregorick will discuss some of the opportunities for artificial intelligence and in health and medicine, as well as its challenges. She'll also provide an overview of the Artificial Intelligence Machine Learning Consortium to Advance Health Equity and Researcher Diversity, also known as AIM AHEAD. Dr. Gregorick was appointed as Associate Director for Data Science and Director of the NIH Office of Data Science Strategy in 2019. Under Dr. Gregorick's leadership, the ODSS leads the implementation of the NIH Strategic Plan for Data Science through scientific, technical, and operational collaboration across NIH. She received the 2020 Leadership in Biological Sciences Award from the Washington Academy of Sciences for her work in this role. She was instrumental in the creation of the ODSS in 2018 and served as a senior advisor to the office until being named to her current position. She was previously the Division Director for Biophysics, Biomedical Technology, and Computational Biosciences at the National Institute of General Medical Sciences, or NIGMS. Her mission in this role uh, was to advance research in computational biology, biophysics and data sciences, mathematical and biostatistical methods, and biomedical technologies in support of the NIH NIGMS mission to increase our understanding of life processes. In this role, she led the Institute's effort to reimagine NIGMS technology programs, including early stage, concept development, focused technology programs, and development and dissemination centers through national and regional resources to support state-of-the-art facilities, equipment, technologies, research tools, software, and service. So welcome, Dr. Gregor. Gregor, it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zink. Wow, that is the best introduction I think I have ever had. It is really wonderful to be here today. So I think what happens is I just do next. As Dr. Zink said, I'm Susan Gregorick. I am the Associate Director of Data Science here at the National Institutes of Health. I sit within the office of the director and I lead the Office of Data Science Strategy. And it's just a pleasure to tell you about our program in artificial intelligence and machine learning, our consortium to advance health equity and research diversity, our AIM AHEAD program. I absolutely love the last presentation. I can't wait to engage, but we'll wait and see when they're ready. But I hope that we'll find some synergies with what I present in AIM AHEAD and what you're thinking of in Compass and other programs as well that I'm happy to talk about. So there's just been a lot of interest in artificial intelligence recently, and I'm sure that you're interested as well. And I just want to point out a few examples that are happening really just this summer even. The first one is the use of artificial intelligence in public health. Doctors Jung, Jung, Jungwert and Holiza looked at the use of generative AI, or you might know it as chat GPT, to answer citizens' questions on public health. Utilizing uh, this uh, method, they found that while generative AI, or chat GPT, can provide very structured answers, but often seemed quite reasonable. The truth was that most of that information was completely bogus. It was not in any way accurate. And, and they have a lovely publication uh, that came out, I think, at the end of January, July. How can we improve AI to be reflective of what's really happening in, in medicine and research and health? There's a lot of discussion in the AI world about using large language models either built on clinical language models. You'll see a picture there of Mimic. That's a, a clinical, a really robust clinical data set. Or using just foundational models like you see in ChatGPT. 
the discussion is still going on. There's a lovely paper that was presented in the New England Journal of Medicine on artificial intelligence, comparing both of these models, clinical language models and large language models, finding that both have strengths and weaknesses. I do urge you to take a look at that. I think that came out also in July, in the July issue of the New England Journal of Medicine AI. But what I can say is that this is an incredibly active area of research. And I think that it's an area of research that nursing researchers and nursing professionals could add quite a lot of value to, and you'll see why in one of my next slides. So what is happening, you know, in foundational models and AI and chat GPT, because I'm, I'm sure that you're interested as, as we all are. So since its inception in December of 2022 and moving on to July, June of this past year, you see that there's a number of publications that explicitly use ChatGPT or other foundational models like BARD in their publications. So this is researchers publishing using foundational models explicitly, for example, ChatGPT. What are the types of questions that they're looking at? They go from ethical uh, medical research to clinical practice, to medical education, and other uh, activities such as patient education. This is a wonderful, uh, this actually is taken from a wonderful paper in the uh, Annal of Biomedical Engineering, uh, and so it is worth reading. And what I, we can see is that there's a, a, an interest in using AI for understanding health and healthcare and health education. So how can we capitalize on this, this wonderful opportunity? So I propose, and I think I'm gonna find that you'll agree with me that nursing and data science are actually a marriage made in heaven. Quite honestly, nurses are leaders in collecting and utilizing real world data in an everyday sense, not only for research, but just in general practice. And I think you're also gonna agree with me here that you actually understand the data challenges in a fairly deep way. You understand that specific data elements or common data elements differ in real practice than in research. And this has been a conundrum for NIH as we move forward and looking at using data at an unprecedented scale. Not only that, but I think you're gonna agree that the data quality and the access and the accuracy and the completeness remain an incredible challenge. Just looking at electronic healthcare records, there's a lot of difference um, even, even within the same institution. This often requires extensive data mapping, data cleaning, data curation. It is a truly a labor of love if you are a data scientist and you're in the nursing profession. It's truly a lot of work. The lack of interoperability between data systems, healthcare systems has been a challenge. It also has made great progress, mostly through the Office of the National Coordinator, utilizing activities such as FHIR, Fast Healthcare Interoperable Resources, which we now are taking advantage of. And finally, there's always a need for greater training opportunities, particularly in nursing and other clinical sciences to improve our, our coordination and collaboration on data science. So what can we do to partner together and how does, how does this impact AIM AHEAD? So let me tell you first about some of the promises of what's happening in AI for healthcare and health research. What are some of our biggest challenges, which are not gonna come as a surprise to you as you are on the front lines. What are we doing and, and aim ahead? And what is some of our impact? And what are some new opportunities generally in AI here at NIH? So I think that that will take us absolutely until the 30 minutes. So I'm really looking forward to engaging. And the first thing I wanna show you is just one example. It's one of my favorite examples. It's a little dated, it's 2019, but it's the promise of what AI can do for really critical uh, particular patients. And I don't know if Joni talked to you about this, but rare diseases in pedi pediatric cases are incredibly challenging and also heartbreaking. You often have to make a diagnosis very early on and get treatment as these are, these are infants. So uh, Dr. Clark and her colleagues worked on developing a pipeline that would integrate genetic data along with uh, data in the electronic healthcare record compared to a database utilizing AI to, to make a pipeline so that you could take dry blood samples from infants and, critic, and quickly sequence them, compare their genetic and EHR data to those in the database and, and actually make a, a preliminary diagnosis. And they, she did this and her researcher colleagues did this within 24 hours, which in the care of uh, pediatrics with rare diseases is, is life-saving. She does note in her publication that 
the pipeline that they developed may be very particular for her institution and her hospital. And, and so application of this beyond her one hospital does need to be considered with some rigor thought. Uh, but it is certainly does point to some of the applications of utilizing AI um, in, in uh, health diagnosis. But you won't be surprised when I tell you about all the challenges, and some of these are pretty acute. Just for example, oftentimes when we're trying to uh, understand health and health disease in populations, we use proxies for what might be a leading indicator. So for example, it's not uncommon for healthcare algorithms applied in hospitals to use a proxy to diagnose or risk uh, patients who might be at risk. And one of those proxies is the number of times that you happen to visit a healthcare clinic. Well, that would make sense, right? And, and normally that would make sense. But if you look at population dynamics and the way that people access healthcare and the amount of money that they spend on healthcare, that is a very poor indicator. And what you're actually uh, looking for if you're using AI to use that as a proxy for healthcare is you're really looking at something else and you're not actually assessing the real health of that individual. And, and this has been documented in a number of studies. And I just want to point that out that this is an example of, of um, in some sense, uh, misleading data. There's also some really interesting uh, examples from COVID. Diagnosing COVID early on by utilizing CT test scans was a really important factor. And of course, the models are trained on healthy and uh, COVID-infected adults using CT scans. Well, guess what happened when you tried to apply that to children? The volume of their lungs is very drastically different. And so, of course, they were over-predicted to have COVID. Getting those diagnosis in children early on for COVID is really important. They, they interact in the community pretty extensively, and the risk of COVID infection and uh, underlying uh, circumstances for COVID is important. So that just kind of gives you a sense that the data has to represent the type of question that you want to answer, and this has been a conundrum for data science. So what are we saying? Sometimes the data is underrepresented of the populations. It really doesn't reflect the populations at hand or that there's biases within the training data set, as you might see in that COVID example. Or sometimes the question that you're asking that is not going to be answered by the data that you have, as, as you saw with the um, proxy of using health visits for uh, wellness. Another thing that you know I haven't said, but I think that you're going to sort of resonate with is that the researchers, the AI researchers and the researchers in health disparity are different. And there's a lack of diversity in the AI community in understanding the diversity of health issues. Integrating health disparities research and artificial intelligence is a unique opportunity for NIH. We are the only agency, in my opinion at least, that can actually do that at real differences. And finally, data needs lived experiences. It needs its historical and cultural context and its social determinants of health. And a perfect example is put out um, last year in the JAMA Cardiology, which shows that if you integrate social determinants of health into your traditional models of predicting heart risk and heart failure deaths, particularly among African Americans, it makes a big difference. And so integrating social determinants of health is, is a goal here, um, not just for AIMHEAD, but also for my office. These problems aren't static. This is not a snapshot of problems. These continue to go on. You may find that you deploy an AI algorithm and it works just fine. And then slowly but surely, it stops really being as accurate as you would have hoped. And there are some reasons that could happen. The, date, the data shifts, uh, people changes, particularly when we're looking at social determinants of health, your health encounters, your environment, your health status, your other status, employment your living status changes, and, and that changes the way in which the AI algorithm was trained. Or there's concept shift. Input and output variables may change. These are time-dependent variables. For example, if you're using quality of life surveys, this is a really big risk, just to let you know that we have some risks to think about when we're using AI for health research. But there's also a lot of promise, not only at NIH, but across the federal government in advancing trustworthy AI, the AI Bill of Rights, but HHS, uh, AI um, data strategy, a lot of promise here. And like I said, I think here our agency is well poised and, and uniquely poised to really take on these challenges and actually make a big difference. But it's gonna take a big, a big effort. 
So I'd like to just introduce to you the Aim Ahead program. It has three main goals, to enhance the participation and representation of researchers and communities who are currently underrepresented in the development of artificial intelligence into this equation. Our goal, of course, in research is to address health disparities and inequities using AI and ML to the best that we can, and to improve the capacity of this emerging technology in these communities. So those are our three goals. It is a consortium. I'm gonna give you a sense of the scale of the consortium, what we're doing and some of the impact. So you'll see here this map, um, and it's sort of a little bit complicated with some different colorings and some different triangles and squares and whatnot. But it's a, it's a consortium made up of four main cores. There's the leadership core. That is the coordination of the entire program. It's led out of the University of North Texas Healthcare Center. The research core aims to address research priorities and needs that are developed with the community. I'm going to tell you about a concept called co-design. How we actually develop our research priorities is with the community. Our training core here at uh, Howard University actually is uh, addressing and developing and implementing training data science training curricula and capacity across all of our different uh, entities. And our infrastructure core. This is the core that addresses data computing and software and infrastructure to facilitate the capabilities of um, AI and ML research. There is no one size fits all infrastructure that will solve this problem. Each community comes at this with their own needs and their own uh, level of expertise. And so when you think about how we're gonna develop data and AI, you have to think about this as a multi-pronged approach with different strategies aimed at different types of communities. And it is a research program after all. Oops, I need to go back and explain one more thing because otherwise the rest won't make sense. So this is color coded for a reason. You'll see that it's broken up into different components of the US and each of those components has hubs. And that's how we engage researchers, how we engage academic institutions and community colleges and how we engage communities. So each hub is responsible for engaging within those different uh, sectors, the Southwest, the Southeast, the Northwest, the Northeast and the Midwest. And then when I talk about what the priorities are in those hubs, it will make a little bit more sense. So the vision of Aim Ahead is based on a number of North Stars. And the first one is that we need a diverse workforce. Time and time again, research shows that if you have diversity in your company or in your program, the capabilities and the output of what happens is much greater than if you have a more insular group. So a diverse workforce means engaging young, young uh, researchers and academics and community leaders to really think about artificial intelligence in a different way. And that means partnering with communities. So I'm gonna show you a lived example of what co-design looks like, but co-design means that you develop your research priorities in partnership with the communities. It's not too dissimilar from what Compass is doing in, in some sense. And this is a really, really important point that um, it is research with the community. Um, and of course, as I mentioned, there's the component that we have to deliver capabilities for, for different academic settings and different communities. So there's a component of what we do that is AI infrastructure. And finally, and most importantly perhaps, is that this is a research program and it's a research in health disparities. And the consortium came together and chose as priorities for communities, cardiovascular disease and cancer. And so you'll hear a lot about these two different types of priorities. This is what the communities told us that they were most interested in research questions. So let me just tell you a few examples of what some of our hubs are doing. There's no way that I could put all of what each hub is doing on a slide, it would be overwhelming. So I thought I would just sort of exemplify what some of the research was um, here in the central hub, making existing Papacola community data more AI ready. As I said, most of the data that we obtain from healthcare and, and health related encounters is not really uh, harmonized or even complete. So making that data just more AI ready is an important component. Additionally, integrating genomics and electronic healthcare data in particular to address lung cancer in native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islander populations. And finally, training com community healthcare workers in delivering information about AI and ML because it's, to many people in communities, it's a bit of an unknown black box and they may be familiar with chat, GPT and others, but really the understanding of what it can and what it can't do is an important component of this program. 
The West Hub is conducting large-scale analysis to address cardiometabolic health in American Indian and Alaskan Native. So I will talk a little bit more about this in a moment, but this is a really particularly important program because of the risk of diabetes in American Indian and Alaskan Native populations. And so this was a real priority for them, as well as collaborating with the Los Angeles Department of Health Services on electronic health uh, care data, as well as digital health care data uptick and uptake amongst Spanish-speaking patients. It's not going to come as a surprise to you that most of what we do is in English, and the dissemination of AI uh, is mostly in English, but the communities that need this actually speak many different languages. And so here we're starting to look at uh, looking at incorporating language and language models into AI. The Southeast Hub is identifying healthcare bias and determinants of high, high risk uh, for cancer death rates in rural Appalachia as well as collaborating with Vibrant Health and AWS and the Appalachian Clinical Translational Science Institute, Institute for delivering some of the infrastructure that's needed. This is a component um, of AIM Ahead, and so this particular group is looking to, uh, to see what type of infrastructure would help Appalachian Clinical Translational Science Institutes. And finally, the North and Midwest Hub are developing a four-year dementia risk prediction for uh, Alaskan Native and American Indian Alaskan Native um, populations to improve diagnosis and care, and a chatbot to assist these patients with diabetes diagnosis, self-care management. As I said, this is a real concern in populations of American Indian Alaska Natives. One of the things that I'm, I'm really proud of is the way that we're engaging uh, young people and early career investigators and leaders across our United States so while there is uh, cores and hubs, there's also a very large outreach component of AIM Ahead and a virtual hub called AIM Ahead Connects uh, that connects mentees. These can be undergrads, these can be grads, these can be community members with mentors. These can be community leaders, AI researchers, researchers in health disparities and health equity, members across the consortium and groups. So this is really impactful because we wanna not just grow um, the generation today of AI researchers, but grow a new generation as well. And so engaging in, for example, graduate student trainees, AIM Ahead uh, disseminates a number of awards, graduate fellowship awards, early career awards, awards for leaders, and awards for community members so that they can conduct research and participate in AIM Ahead. So we have 25 graduate trainees. We have 22 early career investigators. These are assistant professors. We have 25 leadership fellows. These could be leaders who are emerging in academia, or they could be leaders who are emerging in the community to bring forward new ideas in artificial intelligence and health disparities research. And finally, 46, 46 healthcare workers, and these could be nursing, nursing practitioners, healthcare workers, public health researchers who are interested in this program as well. So let me just tell you a little bit about what some of the researchers are doing in AIM Ahead. And these are our early career researchers. For example, Amy Waterman, she's at Houston Methodist Research Institute, is looking at enhancing kidney transplant derailers, an index to predict transplant dropout risk amongst African Americans and Hispanic patients. And what she's doing is she's um, working with clinical and community led um, folks with multi ethnic populations to really build that, those those into her AI model um, so that she can help predict who might be at risk for uh, dropping out of uh, kidney transplants. Dr. Suman Najarian, he's from the University of North Texas. He's evaluating biased and predictive and explainable AI algorithms amongst older adults with cancer who are also taking magnesium supplements. So it's a pretty interesting work. Mm -hmm. And here he's uh, integrating multiple data sources social determinants of health and other uh, diverse types of data, including uh, population data from rural populations. Dr. Alexander Stokes, he's addressing intersex and underdiagnosed and underrecognized issues within that community and mitigating bias in the application of AI at the intersex uh, research uh, intersection. And finally, Liu Hang Yang, he is looking at metabolic risk prediction among American Indian and Alaskan natives because there's such a high propensity for diabetes, this was something that we wanted to prioritize. 
and he's looking at an active engagement collaboration across the consortium. So there's just a few of the examples. I'm not going to play the video, but it is worth watching if you want to see just an example of Ang Lee, who is developing a pilot project to develop AI risk assessment models for folks who have blood clots and also have cancer. So this is a nice little video that I thought I would just put up there. So if you want to watch it, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty interesting. And I have to go quickly. Okay, there we go. All righty. Um, but what I'm really, really super excited about is to tell you what does co-design really look like from an implementation point of view. And so this is the work in partnership with a, a pipe company in Birmingham, Alabama called Accelerate. And what Accelerate does is it engages with the Birmingham community and our AIM Ahead colleagues to really think about how can we improve community's understanding of artificial intelligence? How can we help identify opportunities in AI that could impact this particular community in Birmingham, Alabama, who may have very different health questions and health concerns than somebody might have in, for example, Texas. We're not all the same and we have different community needs. And so you gotta really get in there with the community. Um, help increase our understanding of what are some of the ethical and biasy challenges that can occur within the field of AI. It looks like a black box for a lot of communities, but you know, there's a lot of real, nuance there in developing AI and in developing data and finally enabling underrepresented communities to contribute to the conversation because that's equally as important. You can't, um, you can't uh, find solutions if you can't be heard. So you have to really, you know, no data with for us without us. It's the same with AI. You know, it's really, it really takes a community. And there's a wonderful video that was brought out by a local news station in Birmingham, Alabama, who sort of went and interviewed the participants of this program and the AIM had folks and the company. And it's, it's worth watching and I'm super excited to share it with you. I think for us, it's one of our metrics of success is how well are we engaging and what is the impact of that engagement look like in these communities? And lastly, before I close, I wanna tell you that there are other things happening um, in my office and at NIH's with Compass and Bridge to AI in the AI space. And one of the things that we have done over the past two years, and we will continue to do so, heads up, is to supplement existing NIH funded researchers who are interested in this space to develop ethical frameworks and look at bias and risk mitigation in AI and ML. These are just some example awards. Zhang Jing, she's um, at the George Washington University. She's imp improving the ability uh, to explain AI trust models to detect bias. Du Zhang Jing, he is uh, from the University of Texas Health Center. He's looking at integrating genetics with neuroimaging data as a way to integrate and understand very early detection of Alzheimer's disease. And Andre Holder, he's at Emory. He's looking at integrating um, uh, cardio metabolic data in time. Um, so that you can actually detect sepsis as, as part of organ failure really early on. It's some really interesting work and just congratulations to all of these researchers who are really at the forefront of the ethical and uh, bias and development of addressing uh, AI. And finally, what are some of the things on the horizon? We will put out fairly soon our strategic plan for data science 2023 through 2028. It was just presented to the Council of Councils. Some of the things that will be happening in the future, I hope that we can all get excited about is developing social and technical solutions for ethical AI, creating and validating approaches potentially for synthetic clinical data sets for AI, leveraging new technologies and methods, really building upon some of those ideas of foundational models or large language models um, to accelerate biomedical and biobehavioral research, developing new technologies that will enhance the translation of data to knowledge. You might know these as um, knowledge graphs and uh, enhancing our capacity and capabilities through AI partnerships across our federal agencies and communities. And Encompass is a perfect example of some of the really wonderful work that's gonna happen and mm, making a little slice of that pie for AI might be really cool. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, I wanna leave you with a picture of my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Patty Brennan, who is retiring at the end of this month. So sad for all of us. <laughs> who said, actually, this is taken directly from her 19, uh, 2015 publication in the Journal of Nursing Scholarship, nursing needs big data and 
big data needs nursing. And so with that, I'd say, let's engage and I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Gregrick. And I've asked Dr. Stone if she could lead our discussion. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gregrich. That Gregrich, Gregrich. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, a very, very stimulating uh, discussion and talk. And the problems that you bring up with AI and the, you know, the changing the data potential data biases and you know, con and the concept concept shifts and things and how to keep on top of it as well as engaging the users that very very important and very very real there's no doubt about it um and i do think nursing and data science are a marriage made in heaven i do come from a university that has a large data science um uh, you know cohort of of researchers including led by sue bakken and Rebecca Schnall and Max Coca, just to name a few of them. Um, and many of the things that you talked about have also been talked about by a group of international researchers that was led by um, Tariq Anderson, how they, when they discuss human-centered AI in the healthcare, uh, in healthcare using five lenses, it's very similar, um, you know, of talking about um, how there is bias in technologies uh, in, in, in electronic health records or in, in nurses or doctor's notes. And I do know some nurse scientists that are using uh, machine learning, both uh, natural language processing as well spe as speech recognition to look at um, problems in that, you know, like looking at why people don't accept palliative care. They're using speech re recognition by, you know, having the, um, the, initial discussion is audio tape as well as another uh, nurse who's looking has an r1 that's uh, probably going to get funded fundable range uh veronica barcelona who's looking at uh how there can be stigmatizing um remarks in ob notes that contribute to the poor maternal health outcomes of of minority women so it's 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 very very important, and it's one of the things that they talk about in in this article is about how algorithms that support health health equity are needed, as you said. I think your co-design is very important because the people that when AI is there, we need to be making sure that it works, and it's user friendly, as well as it also, um, you know, look at it from the socio technical technological area that how it impacts workflow because we do know that sometimes the electronic health records are not really that that easy in in the clinical setting um one of the things and i think it gets to where you were talking about concept shifts but um one of the things that that this other article talked about they called it in the wild mm -hmm. and you know i think i think of it as sort of comparative effectiveness like real world research they call it implementation science but you know um how do we really trans one of my first questions what what do we need as nurses or or any scientists to do to really make sure that the translation of these ai systems really work in the in the dynamic society we're in and anything you can talk about that oh thank you that those are great questions a great commentary i'm familiar with tzik and his work and, and it's very very forward thinking yeah. and i think that for us uh we need to really understand you know when and this is where nurses can really come in handy when the when the ai algorithm is actually implemented and it's predictive and it's really helpful versus um when it's it's not providing correct information. So sometimes we'll call that ground truthing. We do need to understand that AI can't be just um, sort of transplanted from one site to another. Oftentimes this is very challenging, although I know it is a holy grail. It is. Mm -hmm. And so really testing, validating, assessing feedback, you know, thinking about this as sort of a human in the loop kind of concept where we, we are constantly iterating and improving on the algorithms and the AI that we have using new data. And this really does take somebody who's on the ground and actually understands the data and understands the patients. Because oftentimes people sort of, they know in their gut, um, you know, what's going on. And, and if the algorithm isn't 
necessarily matching that, we have to really look at that and, and assess in a really critical way. That doesn't mean that one is right or wrong, but we do have to sort of take that human experience and, and integrate that into the way that we uh, work with and deliver AI, at least in my opinion, I think that would be a, a, a very nice strategy. Yeah, thanks, I do too. Um, one of the other things that um, you might be, I'm sure you're probably aware of, is the Nursing and the Artificial Intelligence Leadership Collaborative, NAIL. Um, and, and so nursing has been, and the nursing leaders in artificial intelligence have been thinking about this. And they do reiterate many of the challenges that you brought up, so I won't go through that. But it's nice to know that that we do have nursing leaders that are thinking about that. We also, within our T32s, I know that the two at Columbia both have data science components, of, you know, machine learning and natural language processing. Um, both of them do. And I, I also understand Emory's new T32 on women's health as, actually has a data science component. But um, this area is so right. We need to encourage and find ways to encourage to have more nursing leaders and Involved with it, and anything we can do, maybe it's through the CTSAs, or you know, um, uh, you know, anything we can do to get more nurses, um, science, more nurse scientists involved in these areas, I think would be very important. So, any way to kind of encourage that with your um, aim ahead. I do know that there are nursing scientists that are mentors and things like that, but I don't know about nursing students that are involved in anything we can do to get them involved or any thoughts about that would be, I'd like to hear. Absolutely. And I'd like to um, say that, you know, in the strategic plan for data science that we're putting forth, there is a particular call out to enhance existing T32s to augment those with data science programs and data science students and artificial intelligence. And so there's a perfect opportunity here as well. I was really thrilled last week to be a part of the Council of Councils where OBSSR will be putting out a T32 uh, program uh, that integrates data science and uh, behavioral and, and social uh, studies. So I think that there's this is a really great opportunity to sort of capitalize on the, the push for data and AI to really enhance our existing training programs. We also partner with the CTSRs, and I'm thinking that we'll probably move out to the CTSAs in training in fast healthcare interoperable resources because this is a really great way to really think about structured uh, electronic healthcare data and how that can be used in research. And so those trainings will also um, be possible. So there's, a, there's an opportunity here to move forward and make rapid progress. And my office partners with each of the institute centers and offices and even nursing, and we support a program called Smart and Connected Health, where you have uh, nursing researchers who are developing new data and new technologies to implement in the healthcare settings through that program as well. So I just shout out there to that program and our partnership and um and that's a program with uh, nsf oh that's great so thank you so much for your for your comments and that's all i have i have a question going back to the ethics is my understanding is that ehr data is considered exempt from federal regulations in terms of human subjects protection but as we start to link it to omics and bigger data, do we have to reevaluate that? Do we have to revisit that? We are um, we are looking at that uh, that component of what we might call re-identification. So EHR data is de-identified and used in research. That's a common practice. Um, and once that is de-identified, it's no longer considered patient data. It's just data data. But when you relink it with omics and genomics data, there is there is you know some concerns, especially in in many communities of underserved populations in American Indian and Alaska Natives that the potential for re-identification is high. And so we are looking into that. You're absolutely going to see a lot of work uh, in all of us, in NCATS and others, in terms of very secure uh, federal FedRAMP uh, systems that will uh, make sure that that data is held at a very high security level. And we are thinking exactly as you've said in terms of what is uh, the role of re-identification and, and the patient's uh, privacy. This may be a little outside the scope of what you've been discussing, but I'm very curious about this because it came up in a conversation we were having last week. Um, in some of the interventions we've done and being able to feed back the data to clinicians and a federally qualified health center that obviously started changing their practices, including how they were using the EHR. And I'm just curious if anybody knows of any research that anybody's doing to know 
once they do that natural language processing or use machine learning on some of the other EHR data that's not as quantifiable, does it change their practices in any way? Or is anybody looking at that in terms of you know, how that might impact quality of care? I think the answer is yes, and it may be in the research community, but it certainly is happening in the larger healthcare systems, such as Epic and others, where the, um, the risk of doctor burnout is high. And so there's a more trend to automating and then, and then looking at the impact of that, that automation or that use of AI in the care itself. So that is, that is actually happening, yes. <laughs> and it's a really interesting and wonderful field of research that I think um, needs more academics to look at these questions. Well, it and also, like there's a uh, palliative care. It's in the visiting uh, services of New York, uh, visiting nurse services of New York, where they're doing the speech speech recognition. And that's because the visiting nurse services of New York had a demonstration project to get to to offer palliative care. Found out a, a large percentage of patients weren't accepting it. So I mean, it is a tra it, this is a translational piece that we we need a lot, but. That their question was translational, you know, so it's sort of like what you're saying about asking the right question of the data. Um, so clearly we need to do more of it, but, or somebody needs to do more of it. It won't be me, but <laughs> somebody else. <laughs> Anything else? Last chance. All right, we'll leave it at that. Dr. Gregor, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Dr. Zink. Enjoyed the conversations today. I hope to continue to engage. It was lovely. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah, yeah looking forward to it. Thank you so much. Um, all right, we've made it to lunch. Um, we've done it. So we will uh, reconvene. So we're breaking now at 12, 16 Eastern and we will reconvene at 12, 50. So we'll see you in about 35 minutes. Thanks. Back to everyone, post lunch here, let's get started. You won't want to miss this. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Noni Burns, who will discuss CSR's initiatives related to strengthening review panel diversity, addressing bias, and evaluating panel quality. So as director of NIH's Center for Scientific Review, she leads a staff of about 600 and is responsible for overseeing a majority of the NIH peer review process. CSR handles the receipt and referral of all applications to NIH, as well as those to other agencies within HHS, such as the CDC and FDA. CSR reviews about three quarters of all NIH grant applications and more than 1,200 review meetings each year. Now, before being appointed CSR director in 2019, Dr. Burns served in a variety of roles here, including scientific review officer, review branch chief, division director, acting deputy director, and acting director. She holds a PhD in analytical chemistry from Emory University before joining NIH. She worked in the pharmaceutical industry where she conducted research in bioanalytic methods development for phase three clinical trials and provided oversight of contracts with clinical research organizations. So it's a pleasure to have you, Dr. Burns. Welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for the kind introduction. Um, my slides, just great, very nice. Okay. Um, so thank you, uh, Shannon. Thank you to everyone uh, for the invite. It's great to be here. Um, I'm gonna just walk you through some of CSR's initiatives um, that uh, that were uh, um, sort of multi-dimensional initiatives to strengthen the peer review process. Um, before I do that, I just want to tell you a little bit about CSR. Uh, so CSR is one of the 27 institutes and centers of the NIH. Uh, we have a very singular mission. Uh, the broader goal is to identify the strongest science for NIH to fund, and we do that through ensuring that uh, NIH grant applications get fair, independent, expert, and timely scientific reviews that are free from inappropriate influences. 
Um, Shannon mentioned a little bit of this, but just to give you an idea of the scope, um, you know, CSR reviewed around 60,000 applications in this past fiscal year, and that's about three quarters of all NIH applications, a vast majority of the R01s, um, SBIRs, and NRSA fellowships are reviewed through um, uh, the assistance of over 19,000 reviewers in 1,200 meetings. So it's a very large um, operation. Um, in addition to uh, our standing study sections, which is what people sort of associate with CSR, we actually run more special emphasis panels than any other place in NIH and more than we do standing panels. And that's because we are tasked with doing a vast majority of special initiatives that are trans-NIH or come out of the office of the director. These are just some examples, uh, but there's many others um, as well. So um, starting in uh, 2019, uh, we have had this strategic framework uh, on which we base all of our initiatives and our actions. And so this has been in place for, for more than four years now. Uh, and it's in three domains. And the broader goal is to optimize peer review and ensure that we're getting high quality output out of peer review. Um, the, so I don't know if this works. No, okay. Um, didn't know if the uh, pointer works here. It's fine. That's good. Um, so on the top right, you see study sections, right? So the structure of study sections and the scope of study sections and the boundaries uh, very much drive the outcomes. You can have, uh, you know, a study section in an area that's kind of dying, and 10% of that is still going to get a fundable score and likely get funded. Uh, and the other side, you may have really high impact uh, research or really growth areas all competing with each other in a study section, and only 10% of that is getting funded. So it's really a very critical part uh, of, of controlling kind of output um, of um, peer review. In addition to that, um, on the on the left is reviewers, because you can have a perfect, perfectly scoped study section, uh, but the quality of the reviewers, recruitment, their training, all of that very much affects the output uh, of peer review. And then even if you have perfect reviewers, well-matched expertise, you know, well-trained, great study sections, there are just inherent issues in the process that can also affect the outcomes. And that includes, you know, integrity of the process and a variety of other uh, process issues that you see. I'm going to be talking about some of those. Um, and then our, our sort of underlying foundation uh, and our operational principles are ensuring that we do everything with everything, all of our actions are done with, a, with transparency with the public. We use data to drive our decisions. Uh, we have had, um, you know, considerable stakeholder engagement that has really been up since 2019. And then, of course, nothing can happen. All of this, our staff are very critical to carrying out our entire mission. And so we've invested a lot of um, uh, uh, effort in staff engagement, staff training, and staff development. Okay, so today I'm going to touch on some topics. You know, we're doing a lot in all of those areas, but what I want to talk about today, one is Inquire, which is our um, uh, study section restructuring, talking about the scope and the size of study sections. Um, and then uh, a couple of changes to uh, peer review criteria, one for RPGs, uh, research project grants, and the other for NRSA fellowship applications. And then finally, talking about promoting fairness and diversifying uh, committees. So we'll touch on that. Let's start with Inquire. So Inquire is um, evaluating panel quality in review, right? So this is uh, one of those tortured NIH acronyms uh, that's been retrofitted. We all know those. We have one. Um, this was launched in 2019, and it's a very systematic, careful, data-driven process to look at about 20% of all st CSR study section in clusters that are related by science. So they're not related to our organizational cluster, but really how the science overlaps. Um, and the goal is if we do 20% every year, then it, and, and we're on track, uh, that all of our study sections will be evaluated in five years and start the cycle again. So every study section gets a look. Um, it's a two-stage process. The first stage is an external scientific evaluation panel. Uh, we get, uh, and you know, our broader goal is to get people who are broad and who do not have a vested interest in the existence of one panel, because then all we get is advocacy. 
we're actually looking for input from the external community about how the science maps on to the current, uh, I mean, how the study section scope maps on to the current stage of the science and help us identify um, emerging areas. Uh, we also give them uh, really free reign. They can get rid of study sections, merge them, create new ones. And we give them a, a number of um, uh, data, uh, you know, and some of these are listed here and now there's a whole lot more. Um, this, following that, there's a report and some recommendations for restructuring committees, forming new ones, getting rid of some study sections. And then there's a second stage, which is process evaluation. And here we have our institute and center stakeholders come in um, to an NIH panel. And they look at function because, like I said, you know, you can have a perfectly scientifically structured study section, but how it functions, the dynamic at the study section meeting, all of those affect outcomes. Um, so here, too, uh, the panel, the second panel, process evaluation panel, is provided with the report of the first panel as well as a bunch of um, uh, other types of data like application trends, how uh, ESIs do, you know, success rates for ESIs. We also incorporate program officer feedback, but we do that through surveys that go out right before a cluster is evaluated to hear from program staff as to what the issues are. Um, and then we have these study section site visits by, by non-connected parties, kind of, you know, so people come in with an objective look, um, prepare a report on the dynamic of the study section, and all of that is fed back to the process evaluation panel. And finally, when we have a set of recommendations that come through this process, which is a pretty thorough process, it goes in front of the CSR Advisory Council um, for approval. Uh, the whole process is overseen by our scientific division directors. And I won't go through this a whole lot, but, but just simply to say there are multiple steps that follow um, the Advisory Council approval because we have to take uh, time to do some mock referrals to uh, prepare guidelines, overlap, scientific overlap statements, and then finally move study section members wherever their expertise is now moving, right, because some of these are reshuffled. So it takes about 12 to 18 months from the time we hold our first um, external panel meeting to when we have new or uh, restructured study sections. So thus far, we've uh, evaluated 13 clusters in, uh, that's about 152 study sections that are either completed or in process. And these are some of them, and uh, some of them may be familiar to you. There's some committees where, where NINR sends applications that were really restructured and, and expanded, um, and, and those were some of the earlier ones. But these are some of the clusters that we've done, each of them having, I don't know, 10 to 15 study sections in it. So in general, uh, the process results in, in quite a bit of change in study sections. People take it seriously and recommend real restructuring. Uh, we have eliminated uh, smaller, really boutique panels, you know, where there's not that much competition. Uh, we have refreshed scientific guidelines um, and formed new study sections. So these are just some examples. There's a whole lot more. Uh, late stage uh, therapeutics uh, was a gap area. In fact, as soon as we formed that study section after Inquire, it was oversubscribed, 80 to 90 applications, so there was really a need. Um, social determinants of health, this was discussed, and the, and the thought was that it actually just funneling it all into one study section is not called for, but it really applies to a number of fields. And so those guidelines and the expertise has been incorporated into multiple study sections. Uh, mobile health technologies, of course, a very emerging area. And then cancer immunotherapy, we already had two committees uh, handling that, but there was so much interest and so many applications coming in that a third one was formed. There's a whole lot more on our website um, about about this process and what has emerged. Okay, so so shifting gears to you know the process part, which is um, the review criteria uh, that we're using for for research project grant applications. Um, so the broader goal of this effort was to look at the review criteria and, and remember that these are not persons we're evaluating, but it's scientific research that's being put in front of committees, and we want to optimize the identification uh, of research. The first, uh, the first goal here, for a first way to do that, is to remove all of the administrative and policy compliance items that have been added to the peer reviewer's plate 
over the last decade and a half, uh, which we heard from reviewers about, why are you making me do this? Right, because in the end, it's burden on the reviewers, it's less attention on what we want to use them for, which is their scientific advice, and that's the purpose of first level of peer review. And then the other part is, you know, the, the investigator and environment criterion. So that becomes problematic and biases creep in because people start evaluating the investigator and the actual environment as in the institution. Uh, whereas really what we are looking for there is to evaluate the research and the investigator and environment in the context of that research. Can they do the work? Are the resources available? That's really different from tell us what you think about the investigator or how great is the institution. So it's really the reputational bias aspect uh, that we were looking to address there. So here's a, a, just a quick snapshot of the changes that are coming to peer review framework for research project grants. Um, the, the five review criteria which we're required to use um, legally, uh, significance, innovation, approach, investigators, and environment, are being reshuffled into three factors. It's, it's, if you think about it, it is should it be done, can it be done, and will it be done? So factor one is importance of the research. This all, I mean, I'll talk a little bit about the process. This was not something we developed in CSR. It was in very much in partnership with, with the external community and working groups. Um, so the first one is importance of the research, which is scored, and that includes significance and innovation. Innovation and significance, both of them were, were, when we got feedback, we heard that these are problematic criteria for people to interpret. Is it technical innovation, conceptual? Does everything need to be innovative? What if it's boring but really important? Right? I mean, no, really. That's, you know, if you, so my colleague was here earlier, uh, Susan Gregorick, right? Database development is not that exciting, but it's really important. Right, so how do we deal with things like that? What about breadth of research? You know, if you are aware, community-based research, if the impact is on, on a smaller community, but it's really important for that community. So there's multiple ways in which this becomes confusing. What this does is one score is needed for the reviewer's assessment of the importance. They can weight things as they want. So each one is not scored. Rigor and feasibility. Uh, has the approach, and then we renamed factor three to expertise and resources, because after all, that's what we want reviewers to evaluate in terms of the project. Uh, that one is not going to be scored, because when you have nine bins, um, when you have nine bins, bias creeps in, right? You have death by a thousand cuts, Harvard, one. It's an HBCU, has all of the, all of the resources available to do the work, three. It's not bad but it's a three, right? When you make it a binary choice, then people have to put up or not, right? So they have to then say, yeah, it's either appropriate or if it's not appropriate, what's the gap? Because if there's a gap, we wanna know about it. It should affect overall impact score. Um, the additional review criteria, uh, which are not scored currently by themselves, but do affect overall impact score remain. Um, and most additional review considerations, which never have had any bearing on overall score, have been taken away uh, from peer review. There's no point in having scientific experts convened and spend their time on things that we don't need them for. Um, for clinical trials and for human subjects research, uh, the committee and sort of our, our external advisors as well as internal NIH felt it was really important to incorporate the inclusions into factor two, right? So, so not just sort of as an afterthought and additional criteria, but really is a study really f rigorous if it doesn't include the broader population? If, you know, so I think that was really important. Uh, that is now being incorporated into the scored factor two. So just a, a quick touching on the community input and our process and timeline. So this effort started in January of 2020 when I charged a working group of CSR's advisory council. We did uh, a lot of initial input gathering through blog posts. Uh, people really wanted to say we got a huge response because, you know, when you talk about peer review, everyone has an opinion and we got it. But they were really thoughtful. I thought, I mean, I thought they were good, good. We needed to hear that. Um, we formed two advisory council working groups. They had overlapping membership, and they looked at non-clinical trials, which is a vast majority of NIH applications, 
and clinical trials, which is around 10% uh, of NIH applications. We provided them with the regulatory and legal guardrails, um, and they held a number of virtual meetings through the pandemic. They really worked very, very hard, um, and it was fully approved by the, uh, uh, our full advisory council. Um, for just over a year after that, uh, an internal uh, high-level uh, extramural policy group took those recommendations, made some, our, some of our modifications to it, and then that was approved by NIH leadership. Uh, we put this out uh, as an RFI. Once we had slightly more developed recommendations, we put it out for as an RFI uh, at the end of last year, and a majority of what we got back uh, was the public was supportive. Now, that's not surprising given that you know, we had gotten a lot of input at the front end. Uh, implementation is planned for applications that are received uh, January 2025 for October Council. Uh, the next steps, there's a number of next steps. We're going to issue guide notices. There is going to be a lot of outreach, um, you know, to socialize the change for the community, to socialize the change for reviewers, uh, our own staff, and NIH staff, um, uh, and so stay tuned for that. There's also a lot of systems changes that are involved. Now I want to thank our um, advisory council uh, working groups. Uh, they, they worked tremendously hard and came up with what I thought, think are really excellent um, adjustments to current review criteria. Um, I'll go through this a little faster. Um, uh, fellowship, uh, we also looked at fellowship review criteria, and here, of course, the broader goal for NRSA fellowships is to identify the most promising scientists uh, of the next generation. And we'd heard for years concerns from the scientific community that that same kind of reputational bias that you see in RPGs comes through uh, loud and clear with fellowships. Um, you know, it favors elite institutions, senior, well-known sponsors. So we conducted a data analysis. We just took one year of data because we had formed a working group. They wanted the data. We just captured the previous year's data, 6,000 applications. And, and sure enough, everything that people felt was true. The data showed that, which is that fellowship applications come from a small, a large number of fellowship applications come from a small number of institutions. Those that submit a large number of applications, those institutions tend to do better in peer review, and then the outcomes is directly related, the, 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 uh, how good the outcome is is directly related to how senior the sponsor is. So, um, I'll, I'll, you know, I basically have told you the results, so I don't have to necessarily show all of this if we're limited on time, but uh, really what this shows on the very right-hand side is um, 15 institutions for that 6,000 applications in that one-year period, 15 institutions submitted more than 100 applications, NRSA fellowships. 106 institutions submitted just one to two, right? And then there's everything in the middle. And that kind of shows you how skewed it is. Um, outcomes, again, uh, those uh, institutions that submitted 100 plus had the lowest non-discussed rate. That's the dark bar, 35% at the bottom right. Right, so they and the highest high impact rate, so they did better, and those who didn't submit very much, many applications didn't do as well. That's understandable, you know. There's a factory; people know exactly what they have to do. There's not as much knowledge, uh, uh, you know, sort of infrastructure and knowledge in those institutions. Then there is um, uh, the the sponsor rank. So just look at the first top four um, bars up there. Um, if you look, if you're an assistant professor and you're a sponsor, you have a, your your trainee has a 55% chance of not being discussed as an NRSA based on these data. Full professors, 39.7%. High impact is higher. Plus, a vast majority are being submitted by full professors, and we'd heard this right because junior faculty are not able to get NRSA funded um, trainees in their labs. Um, it's interesting, you look at that other category that does even better than full professors, so we dug into that a little bit, uh, and that's provosts and deans, you know, uh, so that explains that. So it's very much related to the rank. So the first recommendation, again, we did this through a working group, was to change the fellowship review criteria, which is to focus on the individual applicant, the strength of the science, and the quality of the training plan as it relates to the applicant. Um, so these are the current review criteria on the left. The proposed review criteria actually consolidate these into three criteria. The first one is 
just very much applicant focus, what's the potential, the goals of the applicant, and, and the prep preparedness of the applicant. Second one is much more focused on the scientific project that is being um, used to train the applicant. And it has elements of the sponsor because it's also scientific resources available to the applicant. And then third is a training plan and training resources. The second um, recommendation is to revise the fellowship application, which is the information that reviewers are provided. So the research training plan, which is the scientific project, does not change. You're still you know, required to explain the science. It needs to be solid. Uh, there should be responsible conduct of research and other kinds of trainings in there. Um, the main sections have really been revised, and, and the biggest um, a couple of a couple of things I'll point to. One is under the fellowship applicant section, the recommendation, and we're moving forward with it, is to not have grades. That was something that uh, that came through loud and clear from the community, from the working groups, and the idea that that the undergraduate grades. Um, don't really are not really an indicator of success, uh, say in postdoctoral research. Uh, and in fact, when they're provided, people use it to make sort of what I would consider silly distinctions. You know, a B plus in organic chemistry in sophomore year versus, I don't know, a B. Uh, we don't really want we want reviewers to actually look at what the fellowship is meant for, which is training. Uh, the other thing is uh, eliminating the uh, financial support or the sponsor funding. This is meant to support the trainee. And the financial support can really put the, the sponsors on an uneven footing where people who are heavily funded or have big factory labs can tend to do better. There's a lot more. Um, the broader goal is to make the, the, the information very targeted and the training plan very targeted so that you can't use boilerplate languages uh, that we're seeing now in, in letters of support um, and such. Um, one new item that's being recommended uh, that we're still working through is to allow an optional statement of special circumstances. This is, you know, so for example, if, uh, you know, COVID-19, of course, provides one uh, example of, of where something hindered the trainee's progress. Another could be that they were harassed in the lab and had to move uh, midway to a different lab. Uh, those kinds of things to be allowed as option but not required um, so that we're still discussing that uh, internally to how that would look. Um, similar to the other RPG process, we did convene a, a CSR Advisory Council working group. I charged this in uh, September of 21. Um, and then we gathered again through blog posts uh, information. We provided those data and the content analysis to the working group and a lot more data that I showed you. And then they, they made these recommendations that the full Advisory Council uh, approved. Uh, following that, there was the, made its way through the NIH and it was approved by um, uh, IC directors and NIH leadership. We opened an RFI uh, that just closed in June. The report should be available hopefully this week. Uh, I just saw the final version of the report from the request for information. Again, majority are supportive of the changes being proposed, mostly because we got a lot of input on the front end anyway. Uh, same implementation timeline uh, for now. Um, that's that's at least our goal. And I just want to acknowledge uh, the working group uh, for NRSA fellowship criteria. We had our council members, our staff from across NIH, um, as well as a number of ad hocs. Okay, um, so I like to talk about not just simplified review, because usually uh, these days, now that we're changing review criteria, people want me to come and talk about what's changing in review criteria. But then inevitably the question comes, but that's not enough to really change, uh, to, to really affect fairness of review. It's a part piece of it. So now I don't accept those assignments. I just come and I want to talk about sort of our broader efforts at promoting fairness. Um, first of all, CSR conducts incoming chair orientation for study section chairs. We do this every year in nine to 10 sessions. We have around 90 incoming chairs because uh, we have about 180 chartered committees. And so they have two year terms and they cycle um, cycle down uh, every, um, every year, about half of them cycle off. Uh, we spend a fair amount of time looking at the influence of the chair in promoting fairness and a culture uh, in the study section that's positive and inclusive. 
Um, and a lot of it is spent in interactions with each other. There's a, a slide set and videos uh, sample one of these that's available on our website. You're welcome to take a look at it. Um, so in 2021, CSR launched the bias awareness training for reviewers. I believe that that uh, link was sent out to council now, not yet. It's available uh, to IC councils. Uh, but we have, um, this is 30 minute training that's delivered to reviewers four weeks prior to, to the review meeting. Uh, we developed this also in conjunction with an advisory council working group, and it's not meant to be implicit bias training. We're not trying to change hearts and minds in 30 minutes before, four weeks before a study section meeting, right? What we're trying to do is to prevent the biases that we know are out there in the biomedical community and the research community from infiltrating the peer review process, which is just a microcosm of the community. It's 19,000 individuals out there, right? Um, so we're just trying to prevent or mitigate that in the, in the review meeting itself. So we've had 22,000 reviewers taken the training. It's been really well received. We've had, we've done a, a uh, significant sort of surveying, um, and and we're seeing anecdotally also that the training is referred to during the meeting uh, by by you know bystanders who will say no that's not allowed because that's what we heard, learned in the training. Um, beginning in the May 2024 council, um, NIH leadership wanted this to be made available to or required for all NIH reviewers, not just CSR. So that's going to be. Um, uh, going to be happening soon for the January, February, March meetings. Uh, the full survey analysis is available on our website. Uh, similarly, review integrity training, we've had a version one, but we now have a version two that we have launched. This is also developed in conjunction with um, external advisory council um, working groups. Uh, it's looking at scenario-based training before, during, and after the meeting. Um, these are all actual cases. So, you know, I hope that all of you, when you've served on committees, are lucky enough to not find any of these case studies familiar. Uh, but unfortunately, these are all real case studies uh, based on cases that we've seen and taken action on. Um, more than 16,000 reviewers have completed the training. I mean, one of the things we heard was, re was from our reviewers and from the external communities. They really wanted ways and tools to handle um, potential integrity violations. Like if you go to a conference and someone comes up to you and say, hey, I know you were a reviewer on my committee, you know, how did this go? Or can you keep an eye out? What do they do right there in the moment? Because you're also members of the scientific community, you want to be collegial, but this is really critical, right? Really critical to manage this well. And this also will be required for all NIH reviewers in the same time frame. Uh, we do, you know, I, I, we're not under any illusions with, with 60,000 applications and 19,000 reviewers. There is no way we're getting it exactly right every time. There are cases of biases that are going on, uh, out bias uh, going on out there in study sections. There may be disrespect or lack of inclusion. Um, we want to hear about it because if you don't know it, you know, with 1,200 meetings, we're not going to be everywhere and we want to hear about it. So this, uh, Gabriel Fosu is our chief diversity officer. His email is listed on every signature of all 600 people at CSR. So everyone should always know who to contact if they want to report something. Um, we investigate every allegation. So senior management, which is uh, Dr. Fosu and the scientific division director take a look um, at every investigation. If we think, if we agree that there was a biased or flawed uh, review, uh, and we do, I would say around half the time, they're right. We, something went wrong, or it was an inappropriate statement or something. Uh, we will re-review the application in the same council round, because we don't want to disadvantage the applicant in terms of his or her funding. Um, if we don't agree, we guide them to the NIH program officer, because the regular appeals process remains available to them. Now, this last bit we just added, which is we make sure that we follow up with the reviewer, because if a reviewer messed up and added a bias statement, um, one way to kind of foster culture change in the community is for, so what we do is one of our division directors will call uh, the reviewer and say, hey, you made this statement, this resulted in a complete re-review because it was inappropriate. 
Then we wait for the reaction, right? The reaction, a vast majority of the time, is contrition. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done this. I'll pay more attention. That's culture change. Small percentage of the time, they argue. It's not really biased. It's true. Well, that gives us information about the reviewer, and we always have discretion on who we choose to or don't choose to invite. So, and then um, finally, I'm going to talk about diversifying review committees. Right? Um, the, the goal here is to broaden the pool of, of our reviewers, where SROs go to find qualified reviewers. We have very nice NIH databases, but they only have NIH reviewers. We want to broaden that pool. We added um, a number of sources, data sources, other agencies, NSF, DOE, other kinds of funded researchers. Um, society recommendations, we encourage scientific societies to submit names of qualified people. That's all available. Uh, I see uh, program officers, early career reviewers. All of that is available in a really user-friendly format for SROs to search quickly if they're looking um, for reviewers. But we need more than tools, right? Uh, we need to kind of change the culture um, as well uh, of the people who are doing the inviting. So one thing that we've been very um, uh, deliberate about doing is talking about how important it is, how critical it is for NIH to hear diverse perspectives, uh, diverse perspectives in identifying the strongest science. Because if you have the same people coming in, you're going to actually get derivative science out. So linking it to the quality. The quality of the output of peer review is very much linked to diversity. Defining diversity more than just demographic. Demographic, geographic, very important. Also scientific background. You know, four people trained from the same lab with the same pedigree are going to give you derivative science out, right? Career stage, we want senior people, but we don't just want senior people. We want some junior, mid-career. Uh, and peer review experience. We want experienced reviewers, and we want less experience and some fresh faces every time, right? Um, our standing study section membership is very thorough, lots of oversight, um, but our issue is, is special emphasis panels, and that's because um, special emphasis panels are just gathered ad hoc, and that's when people lean to the, to the pools that they know. They're, they're you know, they're well, they know. That's who they reach out to. That's where the tools become important, right? We've also raised collective awareness. We've set some expectations. We share panel-level data uh, with management, with staff. Uh, it's all available um, for, for, for all of our staff. Uh, the tools that I already talked about, most important has been peer-to-peer -peer sharing of, of uh, strategies because we have SROs who are very, very good at identifying broad pools of reviewers and having them share with each other has been uh, has been actually quite successful. So let me just show you just uh, quickly a little bit of data, um, starting with uh, women. Uh, so these are CSR um, applicants, uh, applications not, uh, submitted to CSR every council round starting with October 2019 through this most recent council round. Around 35% of, of PIs are women. That's about, it's not, not that different from what you see NIH-wide, because we, we do a vast majority of the applications anyway. Uh, as I mentioned, our study sections or membership has always been enriched because we pay a lot of attention there and have been historically paying a lot of attention. It's the special emphasis panel, the quick ad hoc reviewers that we were concerned about, and there you see a real shift as our SROs make more of an effort, go to a broader pool every time they recruit for, uh, for an ad hoc SEP. Underrepresented minority, unfortunately, also kind of flat. Maybe it went from 8% to 9% over the course of, what, four, five, eight, four years. Um, and that's also the same across uh, uh, for NIH-wide data. OER has published that. Again, more enriched in terms of membership because we pay attention to that. For SEPs, if you notice at the beginning, it was actually lower than even what you would call a benchmarking against the applicant rate, right? They just weren't being invited as much. Um, and, and, you know, after the effort that was made, you can see a change, and it's continuing to go up. These The SEP reviewers are also linked to membership because once people try them out and they see they're really good, they'll then put them on as members. And so it's all kind of linked. 
So there's a lot more on our website. If you, you know, check it out, there's data, there's analyses, there's reports. We update it regularly, uh, and I invite you to uh, to take a look. I'm happy to take questions. Thanks so much, uh, Noni. Before we move on to discussion, it was alluded to um, that all council members will receive an email tomorrow um, inviting them to complete CSR's um, bias awareness training for reviewers that Dr. Burns mentioned. It's not required, um, but I know that many of you will be interested in that, so I want to thank CSR for making that available. So thanks again, Dr. Burns. Uh, I have asked Dr. Lee to lead us in discussion. Dr. Lee. Yeah, thanks so much, Dr. Burns, for a wonderful uh, comprehensive overview and synthesis especially given um, the extensiveness of all of these initiatives. And it was quite a bit of information, so I won't be able to ask about all of the most important points. Um, but my first question actually is about the third part of your presentation um, on fairness and review. And I think all of us can appreciate the training initiatives on one end and also on the other end, the really formal direct bias reporting mechanism when there is a kind of a known incident. But in addition to those critical elements, has there been any consideration to things like random auditing or some more formal auditing and feedback that can be given directly to the SROs and or the reviewers on how well they're actually using the skills that were gained in the training? Yeah, no, that's that's a great question. So I think what you mean by auditing is oversight, right, right of the review process. So we have. Um, you know, out of the 600 people, there are 27 uh, of them are branch chiefs that oversee a group of 8 to 10 or 12 SROs. And we have division directors. Uh, we have, um, you know, a, a pretty rigorous evaluation um, for SROs. And, and I, our staff, our senior staff, attend meetings, provide feedback. When um, there, I'll, I'll just have you say that the, the the largest number of sort of bias instances that we get that result in re-review do not come from the external community. They come from us or they come from the SRO, frankly, because our SROs are now very sort of have heightened awareness. Um, and our numbers um, show that most of it comes from the SRO. Sometimes they'll come back and they'll say, this one didn't go well. This is what happened. There's a discussion with leadership or with, with their management. And then a re-review is done. So, yeah, I think there's continuous evaluation that's happening um, in addition to sort of the more formalized things that you see through Inquire. Um, okay, great. Yeah, and then relatedly, you know, has CSR ever considered any technologies that could be used to detect or like further automate the detection of bias? So there wouldn't necessarily need to be an SRO or other person that would have kind of the, the eye and the mind to be able to detect it on the fly, given the multiple kind of constraints on their energies and time? Yeah, no, we are, we're working on it. Actually, we have a, a, you know, part of sort of the underlying principles that I laid out. One was data-driven decision-making. We formed a new kind of division of, of data that um, and, and technology that is very much looking at, um, at evaluating critiques in a more automated machine learning, you know, automated way to flag issues for the SRs. In the end, though, I think, you know, we still need the human to look at it to see if it's actually um, valid. I, right now, the, the, the processes they're developing are under test, right? So we're trying to see if they're actually valid. What they flag for us is actually valid. But, yeah, it's very much something we're looking at. Okay, great. And my second question is related to the simplifying uh, review. You know, mm -hmm. to me and probably for others, it was helpful to be reminded of the regulatory guardrails review, including those to the code of federal regulations that outline the five key elements that kind of have to be part of the review mm -hmm. criteria. But I'm thinking for the research program grants and that factor three that now is the combination of the expertise and resources that will uh, include the eventually former investigator and environment considerations that will no longer be scored. Um, with all of the external input and kind of public commentary, can you kind of comment a little bit on like, what was the, what were the salient themes of those who are general, generally for, and generally for those who are against um, factor three as being something that should still be scored? 
Yeah, that, that's a great question. So I would say that it was kind of a normal distribution that we got about factor three, right? Uh, the bulk in the middle all kind of agreed that it's a good idea. There were people who think this doesn't go far enough, we need to blind. Right? Unless you can blind reviews, you're not actually doing anything. There's multiple issues with blinding that we can have a longer discussion on, right? I mean, it doesn't really work all the time, scaling it up to say you can make it work. We're doing a partial blinding experiment with transformative R01s as part of the NIH Director's Common Fund Program, but that's partial blinding. It's a multi-stage review, and it's 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 very labor intensive. So so scaling it up to 60,000 is, is not really practical. Plus, it doesn't work. People self-cite. The other part of it was, well, uh, if you're not scoring, the investigator matters, and and you're not. You should be scoring investigator. You should be scoring environment because those things matter to the to the quality of the science. I I, I think the fact that they are part of the main factors of scoring, uh, right, uh, and still affect overall impact score. We want to hear if there are gaps, and that should affect the overall impact score. Move it down. I think a lot will happen in the training. Uh, to address those concerns. Um, I don't think we need to have a nine-point scoring scale to make investigator count. So. Right. Okay, great. And my final question before I open up to my other colleagues is related to the Enquire. You mentioned a few examples of some like new and revised study section like the mobile health and the social mm -hmm. determinants of health. Can you share with us um, generally where those are on the 12 to 18 month timeline from initiation to implementation? just to get a sense of when some of that will be ready for like prime time or formal change. I think most of those are already implemented or have recently been implemented. I think one of the first ones we did back in maybe 2020 affected NINR most, which was the, uh, I don't know the names of the study sections, Shannon probably does more, uh, the, the clinical care in different settings and the interdisciplinary care. There were a couple of study sections that were formed. Um, in response to the external community and, and, and INR staff on the second uh, level of inquiry review. Those are functioning well. In fact, they're slightly oversubscribed. Which to me, that's a healthy thing if we get a lot of um, study section. At least one of them, I think the clinical one, is chaired by, by a nurse, if I'm not mistaken. So, so yeah, so I think a lot of the ones that are relevant to this um, IC are, are done. Great. All right. Thanks so much, Dr. Burns, and I'm happy to open it up to other members of the council. Yeah. Thank you for a really interesting uh, uh, presentation. I'm as I'm listening to you, and I've known about these changes because it's out in the scientific community and been presented here before. I think, um, but I do think we listening to it, it's going to change the way um, grants need to be written, and the ed the education that goes out around that about making sure people are emphasizing. I mean, I mean, even the structure, you know, of significance and innovation being in importance. I think the sort of structure is going to have to change. And, you know, what what is the education that's going to be for, for the scientific community to, you know, make sure that they're they're restructuring their grants appropriately over the next year or two? So, so first, let me say I completely agree with you. Changing the application structure is a very long, it's kind of a longer term project because it goes to OMB, whatever that is, some, some higher level approvals. It's a part of a big package. We didn't want to hold up these review changes, but I think one thing we got back from the RFI response is the real critical need to socialize the changes in the broader community. So we'll have webinars for applicants. We'll have webinars for reviewers, for our staff. And, and we're spending the next year and a half just focused on that. So hopefully that'll mitigate some of it. But I agree with you. It, of course, it should match up with the application. Thank you. That was an amazing presentation. I really um, enjoyed hearing about all these updates. Um, I had a follow-up question to Chris's regarding uh, factor number three. And maybe this was just a nuance in the study section I was in, but environment was really important for the community-based work that was happening. And so are reviewers going to be told to use that kind of information in the second factor? Because that is usually in our in our study section, that was part of the environment. Did they have letters of support from the people that they were going to do this work with? 
as an example. Was this an R01? It was, yes. Okay. Uh, you know, the environment is there for exactly that, right? Right now it's used for, you know, Harvard is a great school. I don't mean to pick on Harvard. I don't know if anyone's here from Harvard. Harvard is great. But, you know, uh, it's right now the kinds of comments we see is Harvard is a great school. What we want them to do is exactly what you're talking about. How, what is it in the context of the project or what they're trying to achieve? Is it appropriate? Is it not? Um, that would be a drop down gaps identified. Here's some of the things that are, that are missing. And that should then affect the overall score. Okay. <laughs> okay. Great. Thank you all. All right, thank you. So we're at our last agenda item of open session and uh, couldn't be happier to be welcome, welcoming Dr. D Diana Bianchi. So she is going to share updates on NIH's Implementing a Maternal Health and Pregnancy Outcomes Vision for Everyone or the IMPROVE Initiative. So in her role as NICHD director, Dr. Bianchi oversees the Institute's research on pediatric health and development, maternal health, reproductive health, intellectual and developmental disabilities, and rehabilitation medicine, among many other areas. These efforts include managing a staff of approximately 1,400 and an annual budget of approximately $1.5 billion. Dr. Bianchi has had a busy tenure since joining NICHD in 2016. She spearheaded efforts on the 2019 NICHD strategic plan, which outlines goals and aspirations to guide the Institute's research. She also oversaw the crafting and vetting of the Institute's new vision statement, healthy pregnancies, healthy children, healthy and optimal lives, as well as this new mission statement, which underscores NICHD's directive since its founding to lead research and training to understand human development and incorporates goals for all facets of NICHD to improve reproductive health, enhance the lives of children and adolescents, and optimize abilities for all. So it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Bianchi and I'll turn the floor over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Zank. And um, it's great to be here. I wanna also thank the weather gods because I woke up this morning in Boston, Massachusetts as Hurricane Lee was approaching. So I got out in time, which is wonderful. And uh, I'm gonna be talking about our collaborative efforts with NINR. And uh, it didn't occur to me until I actually came to the room that one of our biggest collaborative efforts has been in the, the cross-fertilization of personnel. So there are a number of people in the room who are ex NICHDers, and, uh, and that's great because we can share knowledge about our various uh, institute cultures and uh, continue to work together. So I'm in control of the slides, is that correct? Great. So I'm gonna talk about just Shannon already gave a little bit of the overview on NICHD. Then I'm gonna spend the bulk of my talk on the IMPROVE initiative, which is very important because we're collaborating extensively with NINR on that initiative. And then just a few things that are important um, at NICHD that also represent collaborative efforts and areas in which we are funding nursing-related research. So Shannon mentioned our mission statement. Our previous mission statement was extremely long and extremely dark. 
And uh, when we refreshed the mission and vision in 2019, we really wanted to emphasize the positive. Um, the mission statement, interestingly, which was extensively worked on by uh, people on our council who were in marketing and uh, as well as scientific members of the council, we had to incorporate Eunice Kennedy Shriver's vision. And it's always instructive to go back to the 1962 um, a statement that uh, really initiated the Institute and human development is a big part of that. And um, a number of people asked us, you know, why didn't we put pregnancy into our mission statement? And we didn't intentionally because we are more than just pregnancy related research. We actually cover everything from preconception to contraception to abortion, to family dynamics, to pregnancy, and postpartum health. Our name implies that we are uh, interested in, in children's health, which we are, but we are not the only institute that funds research on children's health. Almost all institutes and centers and offices have some interest in children's health. And for that reason, we formed a coordinating committee called NPERC, which meets every other month, which uh, brings together senior representatives who are representing their institute's portfolio in child health. Um, and optimizing abilities for all, because we are the home of the National Center for Medical Rehabilitation Research. So um, believe it or not, we had no strategic plan. So can you imagine running, it's now actually a 1.7 billion dollar institute. Can you imagine running a, co a company of that size with no strategic plan? Kind of crazy, right? So um, there was no strategic plan for 20, at least 20 years. And so in 2019, it was for 2020, we started out with 270 different scientific themes and then eventually winnowed it down to these five. And these are understanding the molecular, cellular, and structural basis of development. That's our, our basic science uh, portfolio. Uh, promoting gynecologic, andrologic, and reproductive health. So there's a lot of interest in uh, female reproductive health, but we also have about $30 million of research in male reproductive health, uh, male contraception, um, and all kinds of things in that portfolio, which are very important as well. Uh, as we'll talk a little bit about, pregnancy is really a stress test for lifelong wellness. So if we want uh, people who are becoming pregnant to enter pregnancy healthy and keep them healthy throughout their lifespan. Um, when we did the strategic plan, we realized that there hadn't been a big uh, emphasis on adolescence and particularly the transition from adolescence to young adulthood. So that was uh, a major addition to our portfolio. And then lastly, with this focus on our target populations, we realized that there was a gap in terms of, of really showing that uh, various therapeutics and devices were safe to use in pregnant people, in children, and people with disabilities. And I'll talk about that a little bit at the end. So as I said, I'm going to talk about the, the bulk of the talk is about the IMPROVE initiative, implementing a maternal health and pregnancy outcomes vision for everyone. This is a, 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 an initiative that spans, on the website it says 32 institutes, centers, and offices are involved, so it's truly NIH-wide, but the bulk of the work is done by our wonderful staff at NICHD, NINR, and the Office of Research on Women's Health. And it's a little confusing because there are moving parts to it, but if you keep this donut puzzle graphic in mind, uh, I'm going to go through each of these pieces. I don't think I need to tell anybody in this audience that we are facing a public health crisis in maternal morbidity and mortality, whereas most of the world, the developed world, is decreasing rates of maternal morbidity and mortality, the U.S. is increasing. And it's particularly tragic given our, given our resources and the fact that 84% of pregnancy-related deaths are preventable. And it's even higher in 
people of American Indian and Alaska Native backgrounds. So we need to do something, and, and we're very passionate about this. The causes of pregnancy-related deaths vary according to your racial or ethnic background. So, for example, uh, postpartum hemorrhage is the leading cause of death for people of Asian backgrounds, whereas in people, people who are black or African-American, cardiovascular complications either related to hypertension, preeclampsia during pregnancy, or postpartum cardiomyopathy are the, the highest causes of death, and then various other backgrounds, it's mental health and infection. And as I said, this is increasing. The rate is now, over, in the last year that um, statistics were available, it was over 1,200 maternal deaths. And what many of you may not realize if you're not working in this area is the majority of the deaths are occurring postpartum. I didn't realize this. I'm a neonatologist. I've been in the delivery room for plenty of scary um, deliveries where uh, there was hemorrhage or, you know, other medical issues ongoing. But if you look at these statistics, 65% of maternal deaths are now occurring between one day and a year postpartum. So this provides an opportunity to really target that time period. And, and part of the problem is that uh, women, uh, typically, I'm going to use women and people interchangeably, uh, recognizing that all, not all people giving birth are people who identify as women. Um, but people who have given birth are typically under state Medicaid programs were given up to six weeks of postpartum care. Fortunately, that's changing now. I think up to 38 states have now extended the um, coverage of Medicaid to 12 months postpartum. That's very, very important, and that's been really an initiative that's been pushed uh, by the White House and by HHS. But we have another big problem here that's getting worse, and that's the maternity deserts. So if you look at the uh, counties that are colored in red, these are areas where there is no obstetrical care. Um, there are more than 2.2 million women who live in over 1,000 counties that have no obstetrical care, and this is increasing. Uh, it's about 7 million women who live in counties that have low obstetrical care access. And you can see, you know, where it's targeted, it's largely in the middle of the country, the south and uh, the upper west. Um, there was a recent article in the New York Times about, I don't know if anybody saw it, but about really the crisis in the state of Idaho that, and here's where, you know, political issues have affected the ability of obstetricians to practice their care. And this particular article um, stated that five of the nine maternal fetal medicine specialists in the state of Idaho have left the state, and more are contemplating leaving as well. So they, it's going to make the crisis worse, and I, I'm unfortunately confident that there will be an increase, and we will see this map next year, and it will continue to get more and more red. So for, for these many reasons, uh, we have initiated, with the support of Congress, an NIH-wide effort to uh, reduce preventable causes of maternal morbidity and mortality, to address disparities in maternal health outcomes. The problem is, I already mentioned that um, there are differences in the preventable deaths, but certain populations like Black and African American women have three to four times higher rates of death. Uh, American Indian and Alaska Native women approximately two to three times an increase in maternal deaths. So we need to do something. So our approach has included the following. We have emphasized implementation research and community-based research. So we want to expand implementation of evidence-based maternal health care practices before, during, and after pregnancy. 
You'll see when I go into the details of each of the parts of the IMPROVE initiative that we are building research capacity in community-based organizations. And that's being done for several reasons. The communities know their local culture, they know what they need, and it's going to be different in different parts of the country. It also empowers the community to assist, especially in areas where there are no um, obstetricians available. We are also addressing the maternity care desert issue by promoting access to maternal health care technology. And I'll go into that in a minute. And then we're also using electronic health records to be able to do real world research. And if you want to learn more, you can go to this link uh, or just type in NIH improve into Google. So um, I'm not sure if Dr. Zank has shared the term tin cupping with you, but uh, it's a common term we use among the IC directors when we go around and ask for support for programs that really have not gotten a special appropriation from Congress. So um, back in December 2019, actually before Dr. Zank got here, um, a number of us went to meet with the Black Maternal Health Caucus and, you know, they basically shamed us and said, what are you doing? You're not paying enough attention to this problem. You need to address the rising rates of maternal mortality. So at the time, Dr. Collins turned to us and said, you know, what are we, what are we going to do about this? And uh, this was just before the pandemic. So we began to organize our efforts around what we knew then as the primary causes of maternal morbidity and mortality, including cardiovascular issues, racism, and mental health issues, postpartum depression, for example. And literally with tin cupping and support from the office of the director, we uh, pulled together $7 million to support 36 projects, mainly supplements at the time. Um, in the next fiscal year, we were already beginning to see the devastating effect of pregnancy um, on women with COVID-19 infection and how uh, pregnant people who were infected had higher rates of serious complications as well as death. Um, we then decided we needed to focus on the effects of COVID-19 and continue to evaluate the impact of structural racism. And in that year, uh, we were able to award $13 million. And when I say we, it's across multiple institutes and centers for 22 projects. Um, Congress took notice and we're very, very grateful for their support. And starting in fiscal year 22 and the current fiscal year, they gave us a targeted appropriation of $30 million for the IMPROVE initiative. So, over that time, we've been able to now create an integrated program that has six component, uh, excuse me, yeah, six component parts to it. These include the Connectathon, which is the real world electronic health record research, where we can look at various combinations of the way care was provided or medications were, how they were given and uh, begin to determine standards for uh, treatment. We also provided uh, dissemination and implementation notices of special interest, and we are funding, uh, we've created funding opportunities for dissemination and implementation science so that we can take uh, techniques or practices that have improved care and now look at them in larger populations, for example. The Radix Tech for Maternal Health, that was using the same approach, the Shark Tank approach, that was used to develop technology for COVID and have a group of internal and external uh, judges evaluate the technologies for their implementation, particularly in maternity care deserts. We then had a challenge called Connecting the Community for Maternal Health. And this is a program to build effective research infrastructure and capacity in communities. Then there's another program focusing on the communities called the Community Implementation Program, which enables adoption and integration of interventions that are effective in community settings. This particular program is based on 
prior relationships in those communities. And then just recently, within the last month, we've announced the Centers of Excellence. This is a national network that I will describe in a little bit more detail. So just very briefly going through the programs in more detail, as I've already implied, how do we address the maternity care deserts? How do we reach the woman who's out there in South Dakota um, who has a problem, who has nowhere to go? She has a three-hour drive to reach a medical center that is capable of taking care of her. So the challenge is bringing in companies that may not have been working in this space previously and asking them to develop point-of-care wearable technologies to sense a particular problem. And here we focus on the postpartum period for, for two reasons. One is because that's where the majority of deaths are occurring, but it's also much easier to commercialize technologies that are given to postpartum people rather than to pregnant people where the technologies would undergo more scrutiny. So we've already awarded um, uh, up to $8 million in prizes. Again, there are different phases. We're now down to the top 10. And uh, just to give you an example, um, several of them, for example, are looking for evidence of high blood pressure. Are there women out there who can report, who can monitor either through a Fitbit-like device or through their phone that they are experiencing fluctuations in their blood pressure? Could a woman have a urinary tract infection? Can she diagnose herself at home? And then is she at risk for sepsis? There are mental health checks, for example, where uh, participants are now answering questionnaires on their smartphone, and there's artificial intelligence that is uh, going to determine whether they are at risk or not from for suicide and postpartum depression, et cetera. With the Community uh, for Maternal Health Challenge, um, so we, we thought about this because prior to the Improve Initiative, we met with a number of the local maternal health organizations shown in the photograph there. And the idea was, how do we support these community-based organizations that have never written a grant application previously? They really don't know how does NIH work. Um, so part of the support was not only giving money to these organizations, but also providing mentoring and assistance with writing proposals. Um, so we're now in the final research phase where we have selected the finalists. They are conducting their proposed research, and they will report back their results, and they have a year to do that. So we will uh, report back the winners next September. And here they are. Um, you can see that they are coming from different parts of the country. They're focusing on nutrition. They're focusing on several of the um, uh, grants are looking at doula care and extending non-nurse, non-physician care in the community, uh, looking at postpartum, depression, et cetera. Then there's the improved SIP which is also looking at community-informed and community-engaged implementation strategies. And those uh, awardees include uh, these three institutions, also looking at doulas with underrepresented communities. Uh, the Nebraska State one is focused on the Winnebago tribe, which is up in the northeastern part of, of uh, Nebraska. And it's looking at involving kinships to improve ma maternal health outcomes. Um, whereas Texas Tech, for example, is focused more on cardiovascular complications. As I said, the Centers of Excellence were just announced last month. And um, these are essentially um, hubs that can implement some of the research that's being being performed or tested in other parts of the IMPROVE. We have 10 institutions, as you can see here. There are two kind of uh, nerve centers, I would call them. One is at Johns Hopkins, which is a data innovation and coordinating hub. And one is at the University of Pennsylvania, 
that is an implementation science hub. So the vision is that any of the parts of Improve can work with the hubs, use the, research, the resources of the hubs to make the sum greater than its individual parts. And the intent has really been to spread out the resources as much as possible to as many populations as possible and to many parts of the country. So here you can see the breadth of the science. I've mentioned a number of the conditions that are being studied. Um, and we're also looking at different time points and different populations with an emphasis on underserved populations. We're looking at community health workers, home visiting programs, uh, integrated care models, et cetera. And importantly, on the lower right, we're looking at social determinants of health. So what is the effect of housing instability on pregnancy outcomes, interpersonal intimate partner violence, access to care, nutrition disparities, food insecurity, and resource access. We heard in a tribal consultation with the Navajo population in Arizona, we were talking with them about, you know, what are your biggest concerns? And, you know, I've never been on a Navajo reservation, so I, I would have thought it was access to care, but they said, no, it was access to fresh food. They have they have to travel, the reservation is so big, they have to travel multiple hours to get to a grocery store that has fresh fruits and vegetables. So nutrition is extremely important. And here we show you this was done in a very intentional, very integrated way of putting all of these different programs together. You know, you can see that it is spread out to the extent possible. Some of the biggest areas of need are in the southeast, but unfortunately we did not get a lot of applications from that area. So we could not address uh, as many issues in that area as we would have liked to, but we still have a very broad representation across geography and across populations. Okay, in my remaining time, just going to go over a few research program highlights. Now we're going to switch over to NICHD. Here we have our namesake, Eunice Kennedy Shriver, who was President Kennedy's sister. And this is a wonderful book. Um, Eileen McNamara actually came. It's on the NIH webcast. Uh, we did a, a book session with her. I had the privilege of interviewing her. She tells incredible stories, and the subtitle of the book is The Kennedy Who Changed the World, because she not only essentially founded NICHD, but she also founded the Special Olympics. So in looking at our portfolio, as we've already implied, 55% is pediatrics, 30% is reproductive health, and 18% uh, is research in intellectual and developmental disabilities. <clears throat> Excuse me. I thought you'd be interested in um, the outcome of the of a HEAL initiative that we participated in. So the HEAL initiative is helping to end addiction long term, another big NIH wide initiative, uh, considerably more funds than improve, like another whole uh, integer. <laughs> creator, but um, as, a, as a neonatologist and working closely with nurses, I was very aware of the fact that babies who were born to mothers who were using opioids required extensive nursing input, not only to calm them, but also to score them. So there's something called the Finneran Neonatal Abstinence Scoring System, or um, FNAST, in which every three to four hours, a nurse at the bedside would be evaluating a baby for over 20 different symptoms. It takes an enormous amount of time. And based on the score that the baby gets, the decision is made whether or not to give that baby some medication to address his or her withdrawal symptoms. In approximately 2014, Another approach uh, was uh, hypothesized that you could just basically look at the baby and determine was the baby sleeping comfortably, could the baby be calmed quickly, and um, if the baby was fed, would that settle the baby down? So it's called Eat, Sleep, and Console. 
it's very family oriented. It gets the opioid using birth parent involved. And uh, as part of the HEAL initiative, we combine two NIH pediatric clinical trial networks, the neonatal research network, which is based in NICHD, and ECHO, which is based in the office of the director. This was done during the pandemic. It was a whole of practice change. Amazingly, during the pandemic, they were able to train over 5,000 care providers, many of whom were nurses. There were physicians and other support staff in newborn nurseries. And basically, for each nursery, there were, I think, 26 different nurseries involved. Each nursery had its own uh, way of treating these babies, which turns out is different in all these 26 different nurseries. They would go from their usual care, then get trained, and then they went to eat, sleep, and console. And the results were very conclusive. The hospitalization stay for these babies was reduced by a week and significant reduction in the babies needing any medication at all. Um, the babies were followed up to three months post-birth, and there was, there was absolutely no difference in terms of, of uh, adverse outcomes, so it's considered to be safe. The babies are being followed for up to two years to look at the developmental effects, but a very successful study, a massive effort during the pandemic, and just published in the New England Journal of Medicine this May. We also support the Maternal Fetal Medicine Units Network, uh, which was founded in 1986. It currently has 14 sites. These are collaborative multi-site clinical trials and observational studies. Uh, this is really a core network at NICHD. It's looking at all kinds of things related to pregnancy, labor, recovery, uh, reducing premature deliveries, et cetera. Um, the interesting thing is the, the MFMU is it's very mature, so they are interested in seeing what kinds of technologies, what kinds of approaches are coming out of IMPROVE. So there's the possibility of cross-fertilizing cross even more. And then lastly, um, the task force on research specific to pregnant women and lactating women, PregLAC, which was part of the 21st Century Cures um, Act in 2016, signed by President Obama. And uh, at the time, it was already recognized that there was a tremendous gap in how medications are used in both pregnant people and in children as well. But for this, the focus was on pregnant and lactating women. Um, I chaired the task force, which included participants from all sectors, including other NIH institutes, uh, other federal agencies, professional societies, industry. We had pharma pharmaceutical representatives who were really, really helpful, and nonprofit organizations. We delivered our recommendations, and uh, Secretary of Health and Human Services at the time, Azar, uh, liked it so much, he said he wanted to extend it and uh, we need to come back with an implementation plan. The key recommendations included changing the existing culture from uh, protecting people through research um, to, so sorry, uh, typically pregnant people are protected from research. We needed to communicate to protect them through research and really change that existing culture that has been very paternalistic and kept pregnant people who very much want to participate in these studies. Um, we were able to remove pregnant women as a vulnerable, vulnerable population through the common rule. Uh, another part of the recommendations, which we've already implemented, is to expand the workforce of clinicians and researchers with expertise in obstetric and lactation pharmacology and we're working on removing other regulatory barriers. If you're interested in finding out more, you can go to NIH PregLAC. And just lastly, one of our NICHD major investments has been in the Maternal and Pediatric Precision in Therapeutics Hub. Um, so this is another national resource to really expand the knowledge as well as provide ways of studying 
um, pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics in pregnant and lactating people who are taking medications that they need to take for their own health. So it's actually a disservice to the person and the baby if they're not taking medication that they need for their own health. For example, if they have asthma, if they're not using their inhalers or other medications. Um, so this is a, an area that is uh, growing for us. So I'm uh, just a little bit over time, but I am happy to answer any questions. And we're very, very grateful for our collaboration with the National Institute of Nursing Research. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Bianchi. Uh, Dr. Fitzpatrick. Thank you. That was a great presentation. So I'm from the state of Georgia, and unfortunately, we have um, the honor of having one of the worst maternal morbidity outcomes in the nation. And the really sad thing is I haven't really even heard about it until recent years. So I think the work that you're doing is not only important, but perhaps starting to get out there. I mean, I've heard discussions about it from the NCATS perspective and other groups. So it's it's timely, it's important, and I think the fact that you're going into the communities is really very appropriate because my understanding of the data is you can have two populations that otherwise look very similar, and on the surface, like, they look similar, but the dividing line is really where they live, and it starts to get into things like redlining practices historically. Um, so I love that there's a community focus to this, and I think that's very important. My question is related to the, the portfolio as a whole. Has there been any thought about common data elements that you're trying to gather? Because I think there's gonna be the deliverables from the science, which, which is great science, but then perhaps deliverables that come later as the data become publicly available. Have, has there been thought to that? Yes, so actually it really started with the pandemic. Um, I mentioned the NPERC, the Trans NIH uh, Child Health Research Consortium, which is known as NPERC, uh, established common data elements for both children and pregnant people to be collected. And um, the, um, the intent with some of the hubs, for example, the, the data hub as part of IMPROVE will be to include common data elements because uh, we, we really emphasized in our kickoff session just a couple of weeks ago how important it will be for these units to all collaborate with each other. And to do that, they have to be speaking the same language through common data elements. So they seem to all recognize that. And I think it's very important to set it up from the very beginning. Um, and in the various statements and presentations that the 10 groups made, they seem to reaffirm the fact that they were very interested in collaboration and we will be requiring them to share their data. So I, I totally agree with you. And I believe that one of the hubs um, is, if it's not listed in the circle, it has a partnership in Georgia. Georgia's one of our collaborating, actually it's at Morehouse with Emory. I got up at 4.30 in the morning, so I'm not firing as quickly as I normally do. <laughs> and I mean, going back to the comment about awareness of the problem, I mean, this maternal morbidity crisis, I mean, at least from my perspective, was just not on the radar until recently. And it makes me think what else we're missing. I mean, what about the offspring of these mothers and, and what happens when your morbidity rate increases like this? Is, is there any attempt through these programs to also follow the children? Um, we don't necessarily have it uh, with IMPROVE. IMPROVE is scheduled to be funded for seven years, um, but we do have other programs in NICHD where we are very much looking at transgenerational health and looking at uh, you know, epigenetic factors, for example. We're looking at um, you know, where you live and how that translates into the next generation's health, for example. Um, so yes, it, it, my whole life has been devoted to, to really commuting, communicating the fact that, you know, children are the future of America and you can either be proactive or you can pay for it, you know, at the end when there, there's so many complications that could have been addressed earlier on. 
Um, so yes, I, we are looking at that. Other questions or comments for Dr. Bianchi? I know I'm at the last, the very end of a, a very rich I know, program. I know. Do any of you have centers that you know of in your state? Yes, not. Well, I do think that there is more attention being paid to maternal health. Part of that is because there are more women in Congress. But also, I think some of the you know, very tragic complications of female athletes who had preventable deaths have received a lot of attention. So it is rising in the consciousness, but, you know, we, we have to do more. So thank you. So thanks again, Dr. Bianchi. Um, yeah, it was a really nice overview of a number of important initiatives at NICHD and of course improve and we're um, committed to continuing that collaboration with you. So um, thanks for coming. So I forgot or lost track of a very important part of our agenda, uh, which we'll move to now, um, which is on concepts. So as you know, in your advisory role to the NINR director, you are NINR source of non-governmental advice on research directions and scientific priorities. NINR seeks council's advice for long-term planning at an early stage by presenting concepts for clearance. A concept is the earliest planning stage of an initiative before releasing an RFA, RFP, PAR program announcement with set-aside funds or contract. A concept describes the background objectives and potential mechanisms for the initiative. Any approved concepts may or may not turn into a funding initiative based on a number of factors, including funds availability. So today, NINR Program Director, Dr. Shalanda Bynum will present a concept on intersectionality in nursing research. A summary of this concept was made available in the electronic council book for your review in advance of this meeting. So following Dr. Bynum's presentation, council member, Dr. Robert Atkins uh, will offer comments to open the discussion. So Dr. Bynum, take it away. All right, good afternoon, everyone. So my presentation was forgotten and I'm actually the last presentation of the day. So hopefully I'll keep it interesting. <laughs> Misplaced, okay. All right. All right, so my colleagues and I are really excited to have the opportunity to present the AXIS initiative this afternoon and tell you why intersectionality is especially important to the field of nursing science. The concept of intersectionality has origins in black feminist scholarship and basically refers to the notion that you can't compartmentalize people. We are who we are in our fullness all of the time and that requires sustained recognition. So at these intersections of self or social statuses, such as race, ethnicity, gender identity, and sexual orientation, the experiences of people intersect or overlap, producing compounding effects that would be otherwise obscured if viewed independently. For example, a Black Latino woman does not only walk in her Blackness one day, in her womanhood the next day, and in her Hispanic heritage heritage the subsequent day. She is all of those things simultaneously and bears the conditions, circumstances, and social disadvantages that accompany them. So intersectionality theory persists that at some intersections of social statuses, uh, social advantage and privilege is created and embedded, while at other intersections, social disadvantage and oppression is embedded and created. Another concept that we think is really important to operationalize as we move through the presentation is SDOH. And we are leveraging the 
NIH conceptualization of SDOH that Dr. Zink mentioned in more detail earlier today. So I'll just mention that here for this concept, we are considering the conditions of daily living as well as the wider set of structural factors that shape them. So the state of the problem, as you all know, is that SDOH plays a key role in determining health trajectories in its positive forms or trajectories of illness in its negative forms. Belonging to dominant or majority groups based on intersections of social statuses afford access to systems of privilege, while belonging to groups that society has marginalized contend with systems of oppression such as racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, classism, ableism, xenophobia, and unfortunately, the list continues. So we know that SCOH is important in the context of health, and hopefully, and I've communicated effectively the importance of intersectionality, and you heard intersectionality brought in earlier today by Dr. Zink. So what do we need to know to move the field forward? Most intersectionality research has simply documented that health disparities exist at intersections of social statuses. But we know far less about the mechanisms and pathways through which, which this occurs, especially at the structural level. So in this documentation of health disparities at social statuses, uh, the, the literature has focused on a uh, more broadly on a narrow set of statuses, the largest proportion being race, ethnicity, and gender. So this presents an opportunity to expand intersectionality research to be more inclusive of other marginalized populations, either present day or historically. Incorporation of intersectionality and in intervention research is quite limited to date which reduces the opportunity to consider people in the context of the whole person or their lives and living conditions. Lastly, progress in intersectionality research will require methods suited to identifying complex pathways through which SDOH determines individual and population health. And that ties back into the first point that I discussed. Cumulatively, key scientific gaps in our understanding of intersectionality must be closed in order to advance the field of intersectionality and advance health equity. So we are proposing here the AXIS initiative, which uh, focuses on advancing research to understand and address the impact of SDOH at intersections of social statuses such as race, ethnicity, gender identity, socioeconomic status, sexual orientation, immigration, ability, and other statuses that have been marginalized. There are three potential initiatives that might fall under this concept. One being observational research to elucidate the health impact of SDOH across socioeconomic, educational, criminal, legal, and other forces, systems, and policies at intersections of social statuses. Intervention research that applies intersectionality theory to address health inequities. And training programs to build scientific capacity to conduct rigorous intersectionality research. All right, so what does intersectionality has, have to do with nursing science? Well, we believe that the AXIS initiative aligns well with NINR's strategic plan and nursing science perspective of considering people in the context of the whole person. So evoking a holistic approach to optimizing health by fostering understanding of complex experiences obscured when assessed independently, expanding consideration of people's lives and living conditions as health determinants, and by revealing systemic and structural inequities that place some at an unfair and unjust health disadvantage. So we recognize that we have a ways to go to get to the point of liberation where systems, forces, and policies of oppression no longer exist. And uh, But we do believe that 
understanding and recognizing people at their intersections and understanding how they uh, operate in society is an important step in this process. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Bynum, Dr. Atkins. Thank you, Dr. Bynum. Um, yeah, so I, I am delighted that we are um, starting to contemplate um, more intensively this idea of the social determinants of health, structural determinants of health, um, and bringing in this concept of intersectionality is something that I think is is really innovative and thought provoking. Um, and, and one of the things that I think has been a theme in the conversations that I've heard today that I think intersects with what you've discussed is, is this idea of um, how do we start to think about the places that are getting, we've seen a lot of maps today. Um, and, and these maps, um, they have some real common themes in terms of places that are being seen, the places that are, we're blind to. Um, and I think there is something around intersectionality and these communities of greatest disinvestment that are, again, places that Appalachia, tribal lands, um, the Rust Belt, um, these places that we are, are not putting resources towards um, and we are continuing that disinvestment. And I, and I just wonder if there's any thoughts as you start to contemplate this idea around intersectionality and these social and structural determinants of health of how do we um, bring that into that conversation and thinking about these places that we are missing. Yeah, so when you think about places, you think about people. Yeah. And I think it's, it's really important. So I mentioned earlier that uh, there, the, the majority of intersectionality literature day, to date documents the problem. So we know that intersect, at, at different intersections, disparities exist. We don't know um, kind of the pathways and processes through which that occurs. And the majority of, of the literature has really fo focused on a narrow set of intersections. And if you drill that down even more, you know, race is one that is, uh, can, the, the majority of, of focus has been on race, but if you drill it down any more, uh, even farther, I'm sure you'll find that some populations still are underrepresented. So if you think about places, you think about populations and how intersectionality research really does have the capacity to expand scope and understanding the problems so that the problems can be addressed in these places and that that comprise people. Yes. Um, no, I, I think I think you're right. As you drill down, and, and I think one of the pieces that as you drill down that we're going to get to, and it's something that seems very salient right now. I mean, every time I look at the the New York Times are talking about um, this this way that that privilege um, and ways around higher education who is who is giving access to these places that that we know um, give advantage um, and when you look at some of Chetty's work around looking at social mobility and how zip codes probably matter more than genetic codes in terms of how that also I mean so I guess. Part of my interest in, in, in and as you talk about intersectionality and looking at your work, we think about how do we start to think about these places and the social mobility that that comes from these places and those connections that we have with with affluence or the other kinds of opportunity pieces that that wrap around that. So I guess this idea of as you drill down to look at opportunity and the way that opportunity is conferred through through place, but also through um, you know, some of Granovetter's work looking at the strength of weak ties, like who you know, who's in your network, and how important that is, um, given that we know that there are some places that have things we don't really necessarily talk about. We know that there are, that are communities, um, mostly black and brown communities, that tend to be um, very youthful, um, very, very child dense. And what does that do to um, this concept of of how does that affect advantage and opportunity and 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 resources? And so, um, I mean, that's one of the things that I think also could be kind of woven into this conversation. 
Yeah, I think that's a really important um, point. So when we think about disadvantage, the, the, the flip side of that is advantage yeah. and trying to understand how these systems, forces, and structures advantage some uh, while simultaneously disadvantaging others. So I think, yes, um, trying to understand advantage um, as well as disadvantage is important in the context of intersectionality. Yeah. Thank you for that. No, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. I'm sorry, you thought you're forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> well, now I know that I'm not. <laughs> Other comments? Open the floor. Just seems so important. <laughs> um, it, it's related to Dr. Yatkin's comment because we we tried to talk about intersectionality more from an assets perspective, just to change the narrative a little bit and thinking put yourself out, out of the box that we're normally in. And it really got to this issue of intersection, but also within the context. And if the context is supportive, as is the case in some Latino communities, when there's high degrees of Latinos, like high concentrations, there's more social capital, more sharing of resources. And so thinking about that intersection within that context to then identify assets, in the community or in families or maybe even within individuals as they as they cope with whatever the situation might be but um, i love reading this in part because we've been thinking about it but from a slightly different perspective because as we move into intervention research we're thinking about what we can capitalize that already exists and build on those assets so i don't know where we're going to land with this yeah so that's an important point i think you know, and not solely taking a deficit model, right? So assets, so communities do have assets that uh, that can serve as buffers or serve to mitigate the the experiences that people encounter on a daily basis. So I think that's that will be definitely an important consideration in this concept. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you guys for listening, and thank you for your discussion. All right, thank you, Shalanda, Libby, uh, Maureen. So, um, hey, it's been a long day, but an exciting day. Thank you for your engagement, your participation. So I wanna just pause and open it up uh, for any comments or any general discussion among council. Okay, we're good. All right, so then we'll consider uh, open session closed. So it is now 2.38. Um, so how much time do we need? Is 12 minutes enough before we reconvene for closed session? Does that sound okay? Balancing all things here? Okay. All right, so uh, council will convene at 2.50 Eastern uh, for closed session. Um, and I think that's it. I think I did it. Okay. All right. Thanks.